Just a friendly reminder that the opinions expressed on this show are not worth a Canadian penny, so disregard anything you hear that might get anyone in trouble. And despite some of the great ideas you may hear, don't try them at home. Go to friend's house instead. Welcome to this special show. It's not going to be the normal format, but uh, yeah, welcome to Slamfire Radio episode 258. And to start off with, I'd like to introduce and welcome Dr. Terry Bryant, Alberta's new Chief Firearms Officer. And Terry, to start off with, why don't you just introduce yourself, tell us how you got into it and your history with guns. Okay, well, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, so, um, I mean, my my memories of uh, my involvement in the firearms community pretty much go back as far as I can remember. Um, when I was, a, uh, you know, a small child, um, w- the only things I ever did with my dad were go to the range and go to gun shows. Um, I still have my uh, Ontario, I, I remember seeing my you know, watching my dad, uh, you know, when I was less than 10 years old, because I, I can date some of those, those things from transactions that happened around that time. And I still have my 1972 junior membership in Ontario Arms Collectors. So um, I went through, I, of course, I was only one year old at the time. No. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so, you know, time went on. Uh, eventually, uh, you know, when I was an adult, I uh, got back into things heavily myself. Um, I was in, I shot IPSC for a while and then my career sort of got in the way of that, but I continued, uh, you know, shooting recreationally and, and uh, uh, developed a a strong interest in military collecting, particularly uh, Japan and the Pacific war. So I have a big collection of uh, Japanese military firearms and uh, related military. And that's kind of expanded to the Pacific war more broadly. Uh, I tend to like old stuff. Um, I, when I do get to the range, which hasn't been nearly as often as I would like right now, I um, have a high standard supermatic citation and a Smith and Wesson 22 revolver that are the things that I've been uh, shooting on the few occasions when I managed to get out there right now. Okay. Yeah, because you have quite the uh, collection. <laughs> uh, well, you know, uh, somebody asked me how many guns I had, and I said, uh, well, more than most people, but not as many as I'd like. <laughs> That's a good answer. That's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So just recently you were appointed as Alberta's chief firearms officer. Uh, first off, what made you want to apply for the job? What was kind of your goals to get into it? Is it what you expected? Um, well, uh, I guess, um, I've, I've always felt that, uh, the way uh, that what people need to do is not stand around and gripe. They need to get involved. And, uh, this was my opportunity to get involved. I was on the Alberta firearms advisory committee, um, tried to be a, a very active member. And then when this job came up, I thought this is a great opportunity for me to, uh, step forward and if i've if i'm saying that the system isn't all it should be here's my opportunity to uh maybe play a role in making it better and so that's really why i took the job was uh the opportunity to uh help a community that i considered to be sort of my primary um community that I identify with to make a major contribution in terms of public safety, because that's, you know, that's really the number one priority of this job. And uh, I don't think everyone really understands how important that public safety role is, because, you know, unless we, it's, it's, it's really when people perceive there's a lack of public safety, that you get these requests for stupid measures like our current federal government has been introducing with alarming regularity. Uh, And those measures, um, apart from being harmful to our community, they are, I, I think, a real threat to public safety because they are misdirecting resources away from the things that would contribute to public safety. And at the same time, they're undermining the credibility of the system. 
So it was my opportunity to really step forward and show that uh, public safety and a thriving firearms community are uh, not just uh, mutually compatible, but actually complementary goals. I love that, Terry. That is a great way to put it. Oh my goodness, that's perfect. I gotta say thank you for stepping up and and doing that. You know, I had uh, some experience with your team most recently at my local range with uh, recertifications and whatnot, and you guys uh, made a comment about how you guys were there to help ranges stay open, and if not, not that end, but open more ranges. Can you expand on how how you guys are achieving that, like helping ranges and then trying to get more opened up? Um, well, uh, it, there's been a number of things. So first of all, in the routine uh, process of things, you know, when we do range inspections, which are required periodically, um, the, the standards um, that we're given to apply are always, um, you know, gradually getting tighter. And so they have to be interpreted with some uh, common sense. So that's one thing. And, um, and then also, you know, there, in some cases there are deficiencies uh, and there we have to, again, use some common sense. And if there's not a, if there's something that's a serious risk, and I mean, it has to be dealt with immediately. There's no doubt about that. But if it's, uh, you know, a, a sort of marginal thing. Maybe we can uh, work with a range so that uh, they do what they can immediately and have a plan in place to bring themselves into into fuller compliance. Uh, in some cases, we've played a more active role in um, trying to work with um, uh, local um, municipalities and things to try and and uh, help them for. Um, uh, help them uh, deal with uh, issues relating to uh, their relations with their neighbors and things like that. Um, and we're um, uh, gen uh, then, you know, we're also trying to encourage more ranges to open. Um, so, you know, basically by taking a cooperative approach rather than a confrontational one. I mean, my, my, um, slogan or saying or guiding principle uh, is always uh, that uh, we should seek uh, compliance through credibility, not compulsion. So we have credible, if we have credible rules, uh, you know, being administered by credible people, people will want to comply and then there's no need to be heavy handed. And, uh, you know, I think that's a, a lesson that we should try and apply throughout the firearms control system and quite frankly, society at large. And so, like, when you're helping, like, I know there's a few ranges trying to open up around Alberta. Can you go into a little bit of detail on what you're doing to aid them? I know I know of one that's actually really coming up against brick wall for the last few years. Yeah, well, of course, I mean, I can't comment on, on uh, specific uh, issues that are, in some cases, even before the courts. But, like, we sure. will appear at hearings. We will talk to local municipalities and... Um, and um, try and uh, encourage a realistic approach. Um, you know, there are, there are in the long run, you know, my role is also to be an advocate for sensible change. Uh, and to my mind, one of the things that would be very helpful in the long run for this would be, um, you know, if, and it's certainly nothing that's within my discretion now, but something that we should uh, look for is emulating the model of uh, European countries and um, encouraging the use of the legalization and use of suppressors, which would drastically reduce the noise effects on neighbors and thereby make, um, make them uh, much better uh, make ranges much better neighbors for the people who live around them and thereby reduce a lot of the uh the issues that people living near ranges have with the uh, the inevitable byproduct of um, being somewhere where people are discharging firearms with regularity i like the sound of that that's pretty Makes awesome sense. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I'd, I'd love to be able to use a suppressor on a range too, and just be able yeah. to shoot yeah. without the hearing damage. You know, so well, what, 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 
what a lot of what a lot of people don't realize is that that's actually you know in in your European jurisdictions that uh, our federal government would often hold up as models. In many mm-hmm. cases, it's required. You know, mm-hmm. so uh, it only makes sense. And and you know how many people have had. Um, problems with their hearing in it in their advanced stage i mean nowadays we use uh earplugs and and uh ear muffs and there's now you know electronic i'm not that technical a person but there's you know electronic uh gizmos that will help with that but you know it's not always practical in every case i mean if somebody who is out hunting uh you know they need to um be able to hear what's going on around them they need situational awareness for safety's sake so um you know, I think there's there's a lot of things that we need to uh, look at in the long run, and um, you know that's what I'm in it for. I mean, I didn't uh, I didn't take this job because I thought things were going to happen overnight. This is a long, tough slog. It's an uphill slog, as we've seen. Um, it's a slog where uh, sometimes the uh, slope is getting steeper as we <laughs> as we go up. Sure is challenges. Yeah. Well, I'd like to touch on the changes and the stuff you're working on but i'd like to save that towards the end of the interview because i i'd like to get into more of the may 18th and then get into the c21 revival here so mm-hmm. you guys actually told me something interesting when i was talking with you in high prairie about uh mm-hmm. the may 18th announcement that uh well how did you why don't you just tell the audience how did you find how does your office find out about it well, it's not just our office. I, we're not being, uh, I don't think they're singling me out, although I have uh, perhaps acquired a bit of a reputation as the bad girl of the uh, uh, Canadian Firearms Program. But all of the chief firearms offices were really, as, as far as I've been able to determine, uh, had no advance warning of this. And in our case, uh, we found out about it kind of by accident. One of our uh, team members found out, uh, found something online and uh, then, you know, raised it with us and we were trying to confirm it. And finally, um, you know, towards the end of the day, um, we got a message back. Well, there'll be, an, you know, an announcement or a briefing next week. And, uh, you know, we don't get any advance warning of these things, which, um you know, there's, there's, I suppose, a little bit of a, a, a tension between the fact, you know, governments often want to uh, maximize the PR impact and also for, they may have other strategic reasons for wanting to make announcements without advance notice. But then, you know, the fallout is that uh, offices like ours get inundated with inquiries about what does this mean? Um, you know, how do we comply? Um, and... Um, this seems to have over the past couple of weeks uh, really snowballed into something that uh, went from being a minor annoyance to being sort of totally overwhelming. Do you want to actually uh, tell us what happened on May 18th? Cause some people actually don't aren't aware of and So let's just explain a little bit. Yeah. So um, I guess there's two main uh, things. One is that the, the, uh, these are provisions of Bill C-71 that, that uh, had been passed, but they hadn't actually come into effect. Very often, laws are passed, and then they kind of sit on the books for quite a while until uh, you know, either they're, they've worked out a system for actually doing what the law says, and then, th- then these things will uh, come into effect. So for individual transfers, uh, you not only had to just check somebody's PAL, but you had to uh, verify that PAL and get a reference number from the uh, registrar. And uh, that could be done either uh, online through individual web services uh, or uh, by calling in. And, uh, of course, calling in has been somewhat problematic because there have been, uh, let's just say, uh, issues with the length of queues. Uh, yeah. in uh, the units that, where people are trying to call in. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, with the individual web services, that system actually works reasonably well for a fairly large number of people. 
mm-hmm. if they already have, you know, internet and a computer and uh, they have their email registered with the central processing service and they have online banking so that they can or, or uh, an actual in, uh, individual web services uh, account so that they can sign in. Um, you know, we did a couple and, and uh it, it can work well, but the problem is there's a lot of people for whom that uh, those situations are not uh, the case. I mean, there's lots of people in rural areas uh, or older people who don't have internet or who don't have good access. Uh, you know, they they may be relying on on rather spotty and uh, low speed coverage. So uh, the firearms community is probably more affected by that than would be a uh, a community in, um, you know, say downtown uh, Calgary mm-hmm. or downtown Edmonton. Yeah. So, uh, so that's uh, one side of things. Um, and then on the business side, uh, business has already kept a fair amount of, of uh, records, and some of, for it, but the record keeping practices varied. Some of them kept very extensive records, and others just bare bones. Yeah. Uh, so they now have to meet uh, quite. Uh, comprehensive set of record keeping and then keep those records for 20 years. Uh, And the concern about this, I think, is, I mean, the, uh, the, in principle, making sure that people's pals are valid is, is a useful thing. It's a, it's a good thing because there has been counterfeiting of pals and identity theft and so on. I'm not sure that the system that they have in place is actually going to resolve that issue. uh, And it creates because it's because in its current form, I don't think it resolves that issue. I think they're going to end up adding on more and more to it so yeah. that it becomes like a registry for individual transfers. And then on the business side, they have to keep all these records and keep them for 20 years. And if they go out of business, send them unless the CFO dictates otherwise to the registrar. Uh, and, uh, between those two sides, if after a couple of years, I mean, it isn't it isn't a, a full fledged long gun registry right off the bat, but after a couple of years, if they add various information requirements on the individual side, and then they call in the records that uh, businesses have, they could reconstruct uh, a reasonable facsimile of a long gun registry that might actually be. Uh, you know, more accurate than the original one was because one of the many, many problems with the old long gun registry was that most of the data in it were wrong. Yeah. So what you're saying is those that are listening, never mind. Uh, we discussed this as uh, part of the topic. Um, was it last week or the week before? And every comment or every uh, thing that you talked about mm-hmm. was something that we agree. We figure it's going to be evolving into something that is basically a backdoor registry. Mm-hmm. So thank you for explaining that as well. So thank you. Oh, sorry. I, you, I have to, I, I have to, for, you, please do forgive me because remember I'm a professor. So I tend to give long, <laughs> long rambling no, it's answers. Fantastic. It's all good. It works. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I do have a question on these systems. So uh, a peer to peer sale or private sale, you, you have to verify the license, but then you're given a reference number. Yes. And, your understanding, what are what's the seller supposed to do with that reference number? Are they supposed to file that away, or is that their just their record that they, they what? It, uh, well, of course, only time will tell what use they intend to make of this. Uh, but um, I would strongly suggest that people keep a record of that. As far as we can tell, uh, like I, I've done a couple. You know, uh, remember that you can verify someone's pal, and that doesn't necessarily mean that a firearm has changed hands. Yeah. Um, so we did a couple as a test, uh, and uh, records popped up. So you know, there was a record online of the trend of of these uh, reference numbers. But I think one would be well advised to keep a record of them in case one is questioned later on. You know, uh, you sold a gun to this guy. And, um, you know, did you actually verify their pal? Um, so if you have that reference number, then you can, I guess, uh, perhaps allay those, uh, allay those concerns. I've, I've always been one for trying to keep as many records as possible because, uh, you never know when you're going to be called on to, to have to prove yourself innocent, basically. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's too bad yeah. they don't put the reference number in the email. I, I was uh, a buyer of a non-restricted gun uh, today, yesterday, mm -hmm. this morning. And uh, you get an email, and it's like, you got a message in, in your uh, individual web service. It's like, oh, man, i got to go log into that thing. <laughs> and like, <laughs> log in. Yes, I have a license. Oh, you've got a message. Okay, yep. message. Oh, here's a reference number. Okay, thanks. You can well, you know, <laughs> that's, that, that's your tax dollars at work, creating the user-friendly, uh, you know, information technology systems that the federal government is so well known for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I also, I also warms my little heart that no, not really, but the fact that you, as the Alberta CFO, didn't get any notice uh, that there, there's got to be something wrong with that. You get the same notice that we do, basically, or less. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know you suddenly open suddenly you get an, an avalanche of emails or phone requests or or people contacting you you know i've been in this uh, in the firearms community for decades here in alberta and uh you know i was always at gun shows and doing historical displays before that so a lot of people have my home phone number and it's not at all unusual for me to get calls well after I've gone to bed because I'm, I'm, I'm an early to rise, early to bed, early to rise kind of gal. And, uh, you know, with people who are, are trying to find out what's going on and often uh, they know more than I do at that point. That, yeah. Something's definitely yeah. wrong there. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking that your phone has been ringing off the hook nonstop after. Well, well it has been a very busy time. Yes. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, uh, you know, the last few days, I mean, this job is a 24-7, 365 uh, kind of thing anyway. I mean, I, I usually work, like my home is in Calgary. I have an apartment. I've had to get an apartment here in Edmonton. The apartment is a bachelor suite, just, you know, uh, like a four-minute walk from my office because basically all I do when I'm up here is I work and then I go home and I fall asleep and then I wake up and start again. Um, but basically my routine is that uh, I work the five weekdays in the office and then I drive several hundred kilometers and uh, attend a gun show or some other firearms community event um, on the weekend. So this weekend, actually, you know, I just came up here from um, from uh, Calgary, so to Edmonton now. Uh, I'll be here tomorrow because we have some uh, legal meetings to uh, to deal with, and then on Saturday I'll be going to uh, Vermilion to attend a cowboy action shoot, which I'm looking forward to. Should be awesome. quite fun. Nice. Um, I keep thinking one of these days I'd like to do that, but since I can't even get to the range to bang off a, a, a few rounds <laughs> of 22 most of the time, I'm not sure where I would uh, get the access. But, you know, we're always optimistic about the future's going to be better, right? Uh, and then on Sunday, I'm going to a gun show in Castor, and then I'll be going back to Calgary. And on Monday, I head to a meeting of all the CFOs in Winnipeg. And uh, that will be interesting given the events of the past week, which have uh, hmm. not been easy for any of the CFOs across the country, regardless of whether they're provincially appointed or federally appointed or amongst the provincially appointed, whether they are ones with a more expansive mandate, such as myself and Robert Freeberg in Saskatchewan, or ones with a more limited mandate in some of the other provinces. So uh, we've all had in, an interesting week, and it'll be interesting to um, do. I've only met a couple of them in person so far. It'll be interesting to meet more of them in person and, um, you know, exchange notes on on what exactly we've been doing over the past week. And, and in fact, over the past few months, you know, I've, since September 1st, when I took over this job. Well, I have a comment and then a question. Touching on the gun shows, somebody might be able to correct me, but that high, high Prairie, that gun show when I went, that was the first time I've ever seen anyone from any chief firearms office set up a table at a gun show. And then to hear about you going to a cowboy action shoot and more gun shows, uh, as a gun owner, I want to, Thank you and putting yourself out there. And I know we had a good talk in High Prairie and I'm sure there was many other people who had great talks with you as well. So that was well, my comment. Well, well, thank you. It's been, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, you know, I, I enjoy it. I feed off the, uh, 
the uh, vibe and the enthusiasm there. Um, so uh, we've done uh, quite a lot of gun shows um, in Calgary, in the sort of Stony Plain Edmonton gun show, smaller venues. Uh, I've been to uh, Killam, done displays in, in uh, Lethbridge and uh, Consort and Provost and, um, you know, as you mentioned, High Prairie. So I'm trying to basically do um, every gun show that I can get to um, and show people that we are a different kind of office now, that we are supportive of the community, um, that uh, we want to encourage uh, public safety in a collaborative fashion, have people work with us on these issues uh, so that, uh, you know, people understand when we're talking about things, if we're asking them to, uh, you know, maybe secure their firearms a little better at gun shows or, um, or, um, you know, make sure they, they aren't leaving uh, loaded guns unattended uh, somewhere on their property, um, you know, that they understand that we're coming at it from a good place, that we're trying to preserve public safety as a way of preserving our community. And, um, you know, I think that's, that's really uh, a very important part of it. And, I mean, it's great fun. I usually, uh, I don't want to brag, but I usually have some of the coolest guns at these gun shows. And, uh, <laughs> you just got the job to make yeah. everyone jealous, <laughs> didn't you? <laughs> and and it's, it's also educational because, like, the theme of the displays that I do is guess the classification. And I have a variety of firearms, uh, everything from flintlocks to, uh, you know, modern uh, things. Um, and uh, from a whole variety of different classifications, uh, they could be uh, deemed not to be a firearm for one reason or another. Uh, it could be uh, non-restricted, restricted, uh, you know, 12-3 prohib, 12-6 prohib. Um, I'm also 12-5 grandfathered, but my 12-5s are too big to fit in the display. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, pe- it's interesting to see people come up and they're, you know, what they're interested in, they're, you know, either because it's uh, something they've seen in the movies or because it's particularly small. I have a couple of very small guns and, and a lot of the uh, uh, women and uh, uh, children uh, are particularly attracted to these things that they they uh, refer to as cute uh, because of their their small size. Um, so uh, it attracts people's interest, uh, starts conversations, and it's educational because I can explain to people what this system is. Because our system of classifying firearms, I mean, it doesn't make sense. There's there's no real logic to it. Uh, there's a set of rules and you can apply the rules to determine the outcome, but those rules really have no foundation in logic, no foundation in public safety. Um, they're just a variety of historical and political anomalies that uh, have accumulated into something we try to dignify with the dignify by calling it a system. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was Um, trying to explain some of the classifications a while ago to a friend who was asking me all sorts of questions. And I said, you're trying to apply logic to gun laws. And unless it's a safety thing, there's no logic to be found, my friend. You will go mad. Well, what I tell people actually is people will start saying, but this, but that. And I say, look, if you're going to start trying trying to apply logic to our firearms laws, please give me fair warning because – your head is going to explode and I want to take cover. (laughs) (laughs) Speaking of firearms laws. Yeah. Let's uh, let's... get into C21. Yeah. Hot topic of the last couple days. Yes. Well, I mean, this is not just C21. It's C21. Well, it's the old C21 on steroids to become the new C21 um, Mm -hmm. because, I mean, it has things in it that were not really anticipated before. Uh, The big three things. Now, I I do want to say that there are some things in this bill that in theory could be minor tweaks to the law that could be beneficial. But Mm -hmm. all of those things are simply really tweaking things, you know, uh, that we already do. Like if somebody is involved in domestic abuse, we already yank their pal. Okay. Um, So it may assist us a little bit here and there. But the big three items in this are, of course, uh, the freeze on handgun sales, transfers, uh, imports, and so on. Um, And um, 
Um, I just see somebody uh, send here, we need to start a fund for a CFO private plane. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure most of the places I go to have airports, but it's a nice thought. <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, I mean, there's the, the, this handgun freeze. Uh, then there's the announcement of an accelerated timeline for the confiscation of the modern sporting firearms and yeah. uh, historical artifacts declared prohibited by the order in council. Uh, and then there's these um, yet to be announced um, and rather intriguing comments about uh, making limits to magazine capacity uh, more permanent than the permanent ones that we already have. Yeah. Um, and so uh, the other thing that is disturbing about that, and I'm hoping that it is simply lack of knowledge, is that when you read the announcements about magazines, uh, they're just saying long guns. They're not yeah. saying center fire semi-automatic long guns. Mm -hmm. uh, guns. And so, yeah. you know, I'm hoping that that's just out of ignorance and not that they actually intend to extend it to rim yeah. fire and to manually operated uh, things, because that would be, you know, uh, that uh, it's a pretty big undertaking as, as yeah. is, and uh, that would make it uh, pretty much unmanageable, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have some we have some questions. People have been asking questions. I've told people if they do have questions, we're going to actually um, ask them at the end. Right. Um, but um, yeah, specifically, people have asked about uh, the the magazine limit if it's going to impact even just hunters as well. So, oy vey. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the, the the answer is we don't know because yeah. that will be uh, be done by regulation, I'm sure. And um, until we see the regulations, we won't know. Uh, my uh, what what I am hoping to do now. Remember, Bill C twenty one was just given first reading. Yeah, And so there's a lengthy parliamentary process ahead of that, some of which could be short circuited, you know, here and there by orders in council to uh, to just sort of jump the queue. Um, but in principle, there has to be second reading and then committee hearings and then third reading. And, uh, you know, then even once it passes the House, then it could end up again in hearings in the uh, in the Senate. Um and of course, there's always a possibility because it's a minority government scenario at the moment that we could have an election and um, end up with the whole thing being moot if we were to have a government, uh, either a, a current government that reconsidered or which I think is perhaps unlikely or a different yeah. government that would um, take a fresh approach. Mm hmm. Uh yeah, um, it, uh, yeah. Anyways, new election. Okay, let's. <laughs> so, yeah, we, so what we're saying is we want a new election. Hopefully, yes. Well, <laughs> uh, you know, the the problem. Everybody says, uh, "Oh, we have too many elections," but then nobody's happy with the outcome. Um, no, and so, true. um, so well, you got to. Take your choice. I would rather. I'd rather have an. I'd rather have another election that we don't necessarily want uh, in order to get an improved result. Right. But you know, that's just my personal uh, viewpoint. So one question that's been coming up with a bunch of my friends, Terry, is one of the. Is there a possibility that they could do an OIC or some sort of regulatory change to cut off transfers on fi on on restricted firearms because. When I was watching the the press release, they seemed to indicate. I'm pretty sure I heard something in there. Pretty much, we're not going to wait for the regulations to pass to put mm -hmm. a stop to transfers and new firearms. So, do you know if, if if is that a possibility? They could again, like you said, short circuit that particular thing just to really freeze things quickly. My uh, my understanding is yes. That uh, from everything that I have been told uh, so far, and of course, you know. I mean, I, I don't know how reliable that is because, um, you know, I, believe it or not, um, neither the prime minister nor the public safety minister, you know, whispers sweet nothings into my ear. I don't get uh, <laughs> uh, don't get any anything like, uh, you know, favored access to information on those things. But my understanding is that, yes, um, that they uh, my hope is. There have been some rumors going around, you know, that things might uh, have been closed off, you know, within days or, 
even today. Uh, yeah. But I, I, my hope is that they will allow a decent interval at least um, because, you know, there are, there will be people if there, things are going to be frozen in place, at least until we can get that, uh, that law overturned. Uh, there are some people who are, you know, older who may decide, you know, it's time for me to, to cash in while I still can. Um, and so, you know, that might be the answer to some of the bare shells we see in gun stores uh, <laughs> right now. Mm -hmm. uh, if, a, if a few things are, are uh, shaken loose. So uh, mm -hmm. my understanding is they can do that. Um, I, my hope is that they won't do it at least not soon, but anybody's guess. Okay. So let's talk about it. So since Monday, there has been a frenzy with uh, purchasing, uh, people purchasing pistols. Your office has been just a tad busy, right? Uh, well, I mean, there's, there's <laughs> not a lot of grass grows under our feet to start with. Um, you know, even before we, one of the things that really, uh, I find quite distressing is that the federal government is always talking about public safety, public safety, and so on and so forth, but they've been refusing to provide adequate uh, funding and staffing to the chief firearms offices across the country for years. All of them are understaffed and overworked to start with in a regular situation. Uh, and so um, then, you know, uh, as you probably are aware, uh, as you just uh, mentioned, the possibility of uh, this free coming into effect very soon has been a, a motivating factor to get a lot of people who are thinking, ah, you know, should I get that? Should I not get that? Well, now suddenly everybody simultaneously decided, yes, they should all get those things. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had some stores saying their volume has increased like 20 fold. Yeah. Uh, we had one, one of my uh, officers reported that a store that would normally sell five or six uh, in the period of time since the um, uh, since the announcement had sold 129, you know, which is uh, mm -hmm. that's a that's a significant percentage increase. And for yeah. a system that was already pretty creaky, you know, the, the whole central processing service, um, the the Miramichi um, unit is um, we've had some operational difficulties over the last while mm -hmm. and um you know i i I'll, as much as many complaints as i might have about uh, that place um i'd say the people there must be earning their money the last couple of days <laughs> <laughs> okay so we can yeah. dispel the rumor going around right here it's not that they were shutting off the transfers the system crashed is that mm -hmm. pretty much They're what happened busy. yeah yeah uh just a really yeah. busy. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, there were there was also talk earlier today of you know that this that an order in council might come in almost immediately. Yeah. But mm -hmm. regardless, you know what we want to do uh, here, we believe the firearms community is uh, something that should be. Um, I mean, it's obviously it's an activity that needs to be regulated. Um, at least in a modern society, it's inconceivable that you would have uh, an activity like we, we regulate people driving their cars on the road and so on, their speed limits and, and so on. A certain degree of regulation is going to be required, but we view the, this community as uh, a contributing factor. If you particularly, uh, what a lot of people who are not firearms owners don't realize is what an important role this is as a community um, in in many of the rural areas um, in many of the rural areas, when you have a gun show or something, this is like the, you know, one of the two or three big events of the year. You know, I've gone to places when, uh, you know, they have a gun show and that's when uh, suddenly there's every place in town has a lawn sale. And uh, suddenly there's all kinds of people coming, uh, you know, into town. So people make it a, a, a big occasion. Uh, another event that I was at recently, they have like a big fundraising dinner and music and so on. So it plays a big part in the role of many of these communities. And then there's also 
uh, just the community formed by these people themselves, like the people who were on the gun show circuit. I mean, this is where, you know, all of my friends are. And I know that in, in those other, like the various shooting disciplines, whether it's cowboy action shooting or IPSC or uh, whatever, you know, th those people who are regular participants in that, that's their community. And these laws uh, and regulations that are suddenly sprung on people, um, are are devastating to these communities. It's just as devastating as if a tornado rolled through. You know, it's really, um, really just, uh, it's shocking to me that uh, people could be so callous. And we need to recognize there are things that need to be done. There are certain things that need to be tweaked. But the first thing they could do if they really wanted to improve public safety is put some money into, more money into the border, uh, put money into uh, guns and gang units, put money into diverting people out of gangs, uh, put money into addiction counseling because drug trade fuels a lot of these uh, mm -hmm. abuses and fuels yep. the thefts of, of uh, firearms. You know, there are so many other things that could be done with the massive amount of money that they're proposing to waste on things that will not have an effect on public safety. Here, here. Yeah, I saw a news article <laughs> today say. that said uh, <laughs> gun smuggling is still a concern. And I thought, gun smuggling is the concern, not still <laughs> a yeah. concern. Yeah. So, well, you know, the, the thing is that uh, you do need a comprehensive approach to these things because, um, like, as long as we have uh, a drug trade where there's a massive amount of money to be made, you have yeah. people, drug dealers who are going around, they have a very valuable inventory and scads of cash, and they can't rely on the police to protect them because they're breaking the law. Okay. <laughs> so uh, it's natural. Uh, it's completely reprehensible, but natural that they would want to acquire illegal firearms and uh, they will follow the path of least resistance. If they can get them easily smuggled, they'll get them smuggled. If they can, uh, you know, have uh, 3D printers make them or, uh, you know, whatever way. I mean, 3D printing is just more modern. Anybody with a, a, a lathe can make a, a reasonable, you know, uh, a reasonable fa uh, firearm. Uh, mm -hmm. If they just have basic machining skills, it's not like these are, it's not rocket science. People have been making firearms for hundreds of years. So, um, you know, we need to cut things off at the source. We need to deal with the drug yeah. issue. We need to deal with, uh, and it's not just drugs. There are other aspects of violence that we need to deal with. We need to deal with, you know, spousal violence issues. We need to deal with uh, violent extremists. Uh, you know, it's one thing to to have an opinion that's different from the mainstream, but it's another to say that you're going to go out and, and hurt people because they don't agree with you or you don't like them or, or whatever. Uh, and we can't have that in a modern society. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So what can us as a firearms community do at this, this point? Well, uh, I always say there's three things. Okay. And those three things are, I'll summarize them and then I'll expand on each one. Okay. Join, uh, join, Donate, volunteer. So everybody should join uh, a, a firearms organization and a political party that they feel is going to uh, support firearms ownership. Uh, the cost of that is relatively small. I mean, a membership in a in a uh, uh, a firearms organization, um, you know, is I don't know forty dollars or something like that a year. Correct. What's that? Uh, you know, ten cents a day. Um, so that's one thing, but also join a political party. That's even cheaper. You, most of them are like $10. Okay. Um, and so you could join a federal party and a provincial party, ones that are going to support firearms ownership, um, then donate. Okay. Um, and so uh, my rule of thumb that I have uh, adopted and I considerably exceed this myself, uh, but I feel that a firearms owner should donate the value of one typical firearm that they would buy per year. Hmm. So, you know, if you're a person of modest means and you buy, you know, $300 guns, donate $300. If you don't do that, you won't have any $300 guns to buy before long. 
Okay, so uh, if you're well off and you uh, are one of these people who can afford to buy ten or twenty thousand dollar guns, you should be putting ten or twenty thousand dollars in. Put some into, um, you know, into supporting a local candidate, um, and then once you've maxed that out, put it into supporting a party. Put it into, and of course, there's limits in Canada, so you can't uh, donate a huge amount of money to a political party. Uh, donate uh, to a cause. I don't think there's any limit on how much money uh, any of the firearms organizations could uh, could accept. And then that's not enough. Okay. Um, what I've always said is, if you want to find out what's important to somebody, don't ask them. Look at their checkbook and their day timer. Yep. I'm old, so I remember daytime. Okay? <laughs> um, but you know, if you if you if you aren't putting your money where your mouth is, and you're not putting your time where your mouth is, then you don't really value that thing. And so people should uh, work either. You know, my my feeling personally is that it's better to become politically active, show up, volunteer. You know, to support someone in your constituency. Um, they always need people. They need people with a wide range of skills. They need people who can do carpentry to put up signs. They need people with computer skills. They need people who are good on the phone. Uh, they need people who can just walk around and distribute brochures. Uh, so no matter what your uh, particular set of skills are, there's things that uh, that you can do. And, um, and that's how you get access to people and uh, get them to listen to you because they see, hey, you know, Bill or Mary or, uh, you know, uh, whoever, those, they're really one of my key supporters. I should listen to what they have to say. And, you know, this is the path that I followed. I mean, I, I just started to volunteer and three years later, I was the president of a constituency uh, association. So, um, you know, you, you, we really need to um, step forward and everybody can do a little bit. You know, not everybody uh, is, not everybody's crazy like me. I always say that, you know, when people say, Terry, how did you get your job? I said, well, I have hit this sweet spot where I'm crazy enough to take this job, but not crazy enough that they take my pal away. <laughs> <laughs> That's an awesome answer. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, I got a couple more questions before we get into the uh, audience questions and kind of start closing out. So I uh, wanted to touch on what your office is doing. I know you've written some letters. Are you getting any response? Are they listening to you? Uh, well, so we've uh, I wrote uh, a couple of letters to uh, the Minister of Public Safety. Uh, the first one was quite uh, long and detailed about the order and council issue and other other matters. Uh, and basically, the thrust of that was that um, you were going to, you know, they were proposing to spend billions of dollars on something that wasn't going to help public safety. So why don't you spend it on something that's actually going to be useful, like the various things that I've already mentioned, uh, the border. Uh, strengthen police, more firearms officers, addiction counseling, uh, you know, anti-domestic uh, violence initiatives and, and things of that nature. So that was one letter. That's the one that's most well known. Another one that we uh, sent out just recently is is uh, shorter and is focused on the, uh, the issue of the um, uh, uh, the May 18th measures, uh, which were sprung on us very quickly and nobody had time to react to them. Uh, and so I was saying, hey, let's take a pause on this and, uh, you know, give us some give us some time uh, so that we can have some feedback on this. And then either it will result in refinements in the system that make it easier to live with or and alleviate people's concerns. Or maybe you'll just realize that the whole idea was not something you should have undertaken in the first place. Mm -hmm. So uh, those are the kind of letters. Now, do I, uh, do I think that those letters are going to have a magic effect? Uh, well, nobody gave me a magic wand, uh, you know, when I took this job and I could just wave it and suddenly uh, cause people who uh, are stuck in old fashioned, obsolete ways of thinking that don't contribute to public safety. And, and it was going to magically uh, convert them. Okay. Uh, but uh, it's part of changing the conversation. You know, um, 
it's really important that we change the conversation so that people recognize that when we are objecting to these measures, it's not just because it's going to be an inconvenience for us. You know, people are have often dismissed our uh, are issues derisively as saying, well, you know, it's just your hobby and, and that sort of thing. It mm -hmm. is our hobby and it is our community, but it's also the concern that we have with public safety. And uh, when you pour billions of dollars into things that have no public safety value, that's money that you could have spent on something that would have a public safety impact. Yeah. And so when you do that, you're actually harming public safety. So, uh, you know, and, and a lot of these packages of measures, they'll have a few little good things in them and then a whopping big uh, expenditure on something that's completely useless. Well, we here in Alberta are smart enough to know that if you take an apple pie and a cow pie and you put them together, you don't get two <laughs> apple pies. <laughs> oh, I love that. Oh, that's great. I'm uh, stealing that. Okay, so my last question before we get to the comment questions. Um, I asked you this in High Prairie. I just want to get it out there. What are the chances, what's the possibility of Alberta saying, screw it, we don't subscribe to the federal firearms program. We're just going to do our own, direct and manage our own firearms program. Okay, well, that's, I guess, uh, that's a complicated issue. And... Uh, there's, uh, I guess, two answers to it. We can't opt out of federal law entirely. Like if the federal law says uh, you got to have a pal to buy a gun, we got to do that. Okay, it's not that's not an option. But mm -hmm. what I think is an option uh, is that right now we have what I would consider to be the minimum that we could do uh, to say that we have a provincial office. Um, our office deals. I mean, we do some transfers and they do a few other things but the the meat and potatoes of our business is licensing and so we license businesses we license ranges and we do individuals well the licensing of businesses and ranges we do almost all of that because it requires inspections so our teams go out naturally make sure that businesses have property secure proper security measures make sure that the ranges have proper backstops and so on um, and so you know, that's sort of uh, one aspect. But the individual transfers, most of that still goes through Miramichi. And I think that the past while, not just this last couple of days when, uh, you know, the volumes increased s to such a level that, you know, any, any system would have been put under strain, um, but they have repeatedly failed in my mind uh, to uphold public safety. They have not... Uh, I can't mention for public safety reasons some of the things that have have happened and the practices that they have that uh, I think go against public safety, uh, but they have allowed some very serious public safety breaches there, um, and that's unacceptable. And the, the time that it's taking for uh, people to get their transactions processed is also unacceptable. And uh, so what I think is something that is practical um, would be, yes, we still have to operate within the framework of federal law, and hopefully we'll be able to get that federal law changed, because part of my mandate is to advocate for change. Uh, but we will try and administer that law in the most efficient and most public safety conscious fashion that we can. Uh, and, you know, the whole approach that we have here uh, in the Alberta Chief Firearms Office has been to hire people who are uh, the best people we can get to make the tough decisions about who should and who shouldn't have a gun, legally, that is. Of course, we can't do a whole lot about the illegal market, but we can you know, have the best people in place to make those decisions and then to continue to develop their abilities to make those judgments by providing them with state-of-the-art training 
in things like, you know, recognizing gang affiliations, uh, whether it's biker gangs or street gangs, uh, recognizing signs of uh, domestic abuse, recognizing uh, extremism uh, and where it crosses over from, you know, just unpopular opinions into things that are uh, are actually going to represent a, a risk to someone or to society as a whole. Um, so we've really taken a very uh, people-oriented approach to this. And uh, I would like to um, do everything we can to bring back as much of the administration of the program as we can and do it here on that model, show that that is a superior way of doing things, and hopefully, by leading by example, uh, drive change at the federal level. Okay, shall we get into hey, some hey. of the questions? This is actually yes. a good segue because we the first question we have is specifically from Doug Roddenbush. He says, uh, do I understand uh, Bill C-20 incorrectly that there is a section designated to withdraw some of the provincial CFO autonomy, specifically issuing of ATTs and ATC permits? Uh, so, yes, there is a provision uh, which deals with uh, as far as I have understood it so far, and of course, the, remember, the bill will evolve, okay, because there hasn't been amended yet, hasn't even, it's only at first reading. But, but the, uh, uh, the questioner is probably asking about a provision that would uh, withdraw the ability of a chief firearms officer to issue an authorization to carry for the defense of life uh, and centralize that power in the commissioner of firearms. And so I want to emphasize how difficult it is to get one of these permits. There are very, very few of these in Canada. The smallest hamlet in the U.S. would probably have more of them than there are in all of Canada. Okay. Mm -hmm. So these are and, – and I have personal experience with these. Every case is minutely scrutinized and, uh, you know, we deal with them – in a very thorough fashion, but they have to be dealt with promptly because by definition and by the nature of the legal framework, these are only in the most extreme cases that these can be used. And these cases are urgent. They cannot wait to work their way up 15 levels of bureaucracy to someone in Ottawa. The commissioner of firearms is the commissioner of the RCMP. Yeah. She has a few other things to do besides decide whether, uh, you know, Mary Jones in uh, some place in uh, Manitoba or BC or Saskatchewan uh, really needs to have an authorization to carry for defense of life. And these decisions need to be made promptly with detailed local information. And that's why I feel that the only viable place for those decisions to be made would continue to be in chief firearms offices. And I believe the number of, uh, the very small number of these that are issued is a strong testament to the fact that we are upholding the uh, very uh, demanding requirements for issuance of such authorizations. The well, last mm -hmm. time I heard there were like two of those issued in all of Canada. Just out of curiosity, do you happen to know how many of those applications you would get in a year in Alberta? <laughs> Uh, well, uh, I can't give, I can't disclose too much about this because knowing that someone doesn't have an authorization to carry could also pose a risk to them, yep. right? Yeah. Because these are, these are cases where often someone is targeting someone. And mm -hmm. so if I say, oh, well, no, that person doesn't have one, uh, that would be exposing that person to more risk than they're already in. Okay. So, but I can tell you that the number is very, very small, very, 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 very small, very small in Alberta. Um, there are very few applications because people know that it's hard to get and even fewer that actually make it through. So it's, this is not like, um, it is in some places in the U.S. where they have, uh, you know, something that you can just uh, uh, ask for it or take a course. Um, every one of these cases has to be very 
carefully scrutinized by a chief firearms officer and their staff. Uh, it requires, usually I'd say, several man days worth or person days, to be more politically correct, I suppose, several person days of, of effort concentrated in a very short period of time um, because there, we have to uh, ensure, you know, verify that the risk is actually real, uh, check that the police are unable to provide uh, the protection, ensure that the person has full understanding of what their uh, obligations and responsibilities would be if they were issued such a license, and of course, make sure that they also have the technical proficiency to do it. So, you know, to actually uh, respond with force if they were required to. So, this is not an easy process. It is not regarded flippantly by any one of the chief firearms offices across the country, including ours. And uh, I think it's it would be a great disservice to the, that narrow. Uh, segment of the Canadian population that requires and is um, is likely to be authorized to have one of these to focus it in the um, centrally in Ottawa, where there is no way that it could be done with the time that it needs to be done. Hmm. My application well, to get one to go to Seven Eleven is probably not going to go through then. <laughs> yeah, no, it's yeah. not. <laughs> Only to Walmart, uh, I you roll. Yeah. Only to Walmart. <laughs> well, we might be able to suggest a few jurisdictions in the U.S. where you could move if you were looking for that. <laughs> oh, but, uh, awesome. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so, Kyle, do you want to do you want to take up the next question? Sure. I think you okay. kind of answered this earlier, but uh, question, yeah. Terry, is her understanding that the limit of five for long guns would make most shotguns prohibited with one and three quarter inch shells? would allow more than five rounds. Yes. Well, so this comes back to something that I mentioned earlier, and that is um, that we, so they talk, uh, uh, the, the announcements about magazine restrictions uh, have been made by people who, with all due respect, are quite obviously not firearms proficient. Okay. And so uh, they have simply said long guns, magazines for long guns. Okay. Now, if you were to take them at their word, that would mean also rimfire uh, firearms, and that would mean manually operated firearms, whether they be bolt action, pump action, uh, you know, lever action. Um, but uh, it may be. It may be that what they really intended to um, uh, say was the same type, uh, these magazine restrictions would apply to the same types of firearms that they currently uh, apply to, but uh, they just, you know, uh, were overly loose with their language due to lack of knowledge. My hope is that that's the case, um, but there will be uh, regulations that will follow. And it's only once we see those regulations that we'll know exactly what they're attempting to do. Uh, I think the important thing is to uh, recognize or, or to uh, raise the issue with uh, the, the people who are going to be reviewing these uh, things in committee and ensure that uh, people recognize that, for example, uh, you know, imposing a five round limit, uh, if it were applied to uh, manually operated center fire rifles. It wouldn't just be shotguns. I mean, all those uh, sporterized Lee Enfields that have taken uh, zillions of deer and moose and other game uh, for decades in Canada would suddenly have problems. Yeah. And your tube fed rim fire rifles yeah. and yeah, yeah, all sorts of stuff. It would yeah. be a, that would be a right. mess. Yeah, well, uh, and to come back to the same issue that was raised by the questioner about pump action uh, r uh, shotguns. So uh, I have a, a Kui bolt action uh, rifle with a tube magazine, and it will feed shorts, longs, and long rifles. Well, if you were to limit it so that it would only hold uh, five shorts, that would only amount to about three long rifles. Yep. Hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a 357 lever gun, same thing. Do I then have to limit it to the shortest thing that goes into it? Like, it's very confusing. Mm -hmm. 
or I think we'll, potentially we'll know more when. Yeah, we'll have. Yeah. Like, there's so much we don't know. Uh, just wanted to say welcome to Jen. Jen's on from uh, CS AAA. We're going to have her come on in a few minutes. Well, she's already on, but she's been listening <laughs> in the background. Yeah, so I'm, got- I'm, I'm probably taking all her time with my no, long winded no. answer. <laughs> no, this is great. <laughs> Hey, Mo, do you want to read the next question that I've popped up here on the screen? Okay, you're, you're muted. muted. <laughs> We've only been doing it for a year now. <laughs> okay, no, he doesn't. Still muted. Okay, He's... I'll read the question since Mo is Thanks, Dave. Will <laughs> Flu had a restraining order for a fight? I should have had Terry say that. She should have. She would have said it much more diplomatically than I. <laughs> From Andrew, will people who had a restraining order for a fight when they were younger have their pals revoked now? So, I guess I. Well, people ask me a lot of questions of interpretation. Okay, and there are a couple of caveats that I have to. Have. First of all, we don't have the final version of the legislation. Mm-hmm. Uh, second thing is uh, that. Um, the word of a CFO is has no force of law. Okay, so I, I could say whatever I liked, and it it wouldn't, you know, that that wouldn't uh, uh, stand up in court as oh well, Terry said I could, you know. Uh, so uh, that's the second thing, and um, the third thing is that even if you ask a lawyer, remember that once it reaches court, the courts have consistently concluded that 50% of legal opinions are wrong. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, because there's always, uh, there's a winner and a loser. So, uh, but my belief is that this is something that's going uh, as, as I have seen it so far, that what's going to happen is that new restraining orders will have this consequence if the bill stands as it is now. But I don't think that that would be the case that someone had, who had a restraining order long ago would um, have their power revoked. But we're going to have to see, you know, uh, there's an old saying by, um, by um, uh, Judge Gideon Tucker of New York Surrogate Court in 1866, no man's life, liberty or property is safe while the legislature is in session. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and so, you know, we're going to have to wait and see um, what comes out of that legislative process in Ottawa. And um, there hasn't been a whole lot of common sense come out of there in, in quite a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Andrew, you want to take this one? Yeah, question for Dr. Bryant. How hard is it for the CFO to authorize overtime to deal with transfer backlogs? Any insight into the other provinces? Uh, well, I don't know about the other provinces. We were in the fortunate position here that we inherited a big backlog when we took over this office because the federal, uh, our federal predecessors had allowed a backlog to accumulate as they were winding down. And uh, so we got some authorized, some overtime authorized to deal with that, and we're using some of it, you know, um, to help deal with uh, with this issue now. So, um, but in general, it's not an easy thing to get. Uh, it depends. Uh, so the way that firearms offices are funded is, in principle, federal. Like the feds are supposed to be paying for all of these offices, but they pay according to a formula. Yeah. And so, um, the the um, uh, the that formula uh, often doesn't leave much wiggle room for doing anything other out of the ordinary. That is correct. Yeah. Says somebody who is a government employee. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. Anyways, I, I, I mean, I, I, if the, if overtime were easy to get, I'd be a rich woman by now. But uh, all right, <laughs> my contract doesn't call for any. No, there is a question. Somebody does have a question. Uh, do you have any insight in how it might affect uh, pellet and airsoft guns? It's part um, of this this measure or the bill. Yeah. So. Um, there, there is a provision in there as it stands now um, that uh, would affect. Um, so there are there are things that there's a sort of a gap between what's required to meet the firearm standard and what's required to uh, meet certain other standards. So there's sort of an intermediate range where uh, things 
uh, are currently unregulated. And what this would propose uh, would be that these things would be um, uh, now they would fall fall under the under the rules. So they would no longer be this sort of wiggle room. And I think what they're they're targeting. Now I understand the concern that people have uh, that there are people who um, you know go out with something that looks like a gun and um, that causes a great deal of anguish to people. It may end up causing them considerable risk because the police may think they have a real gun and um, many of those situations will end up tragically. Uh, but people need to exercise a bit of common sense here. And, um, yeah. you know, if you are, uh, I, I, quite frankly, I don't know where they, how they would draw the line because, you know, when I was younger, I thought I knew a lot about guns because there were every gun that I saw, I could identify what it was. If I saw something in a movie, I could say, hey, oh, that's this, you know, that's a Browning High Power. That's a Colt 1911. But now there's so many uh, different firearms that have, that look very similar because they're designed for the same market and trying to get around regulatory constraints in various jurisdictions that, uh, you know, just because it's black uh, and is long and has a shoulder stock and a pistol grip, that's probably enough to um, to cause people to panic when they see it. You know, or on so, the flip side, you look at a, a Beretta Neos and you're like, I don't know, that looks like some Buck Rogers toy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I mean, yeah. it, you know, they, they, I've always been surprised when they would say, you know, say, oh well, it will help things if we make make toys have an orange tip on the barrel. Well, uh, you know, if I were a bad guy, I'd paint an orange tip on my gun. Yeah. Yeah, and I do understand that concern when I hear it. But then I'm I'm thinking, well, realistically, you can you know stick your hand with a finger out in your hoodie, and all of a sudden yep. you've got a gun. You can yep. carve one out of a piece of wood. I mean, I have training guns that are just black pieces of plastic. Yep. Yep. So no, what, what we really need to be doing, and in this is many cases, as I said, it's common sense. But common sense isn't all that common nowadays, and so we really need to have uh, you know some educational. Uh, a better educational program so that if people are using airsofts or uh, pellet guns and so on, that they recognize that e even though it might not legally be a gun, they need to exercise some self-restraint in their behavior. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I have yeah. been, uh, my, my husband used to work at a hobby shop for a while and uh, they sold airsofts. And we went out in the parking lot and people were, were ducking around shooting each other with, with airsoft guns in the parking lot, you know, of a, you know in, a, in, a, in a major city. I mean, this, it was just asking for trouble. Why would yeah. people be so stupid? You know, so we need to uh, have people, uh, need to have more education, like retailers who are selling these things need to be educating people and, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure some of them do now, um, but obviously not enough. Well, yeah. And yeah, somebody does something stupid like that without thinking. I mean, we used to do stuff like that when we were younger, but we'd call all the neighbors first and say, hey, we're idiots and we're going to be out running, it, running around in the woods with airsoft guns. <laughs> so, you know, just so you know, don't call the cops. Yeah. And I had well, friends who do it and they used to actually call the local cops and just say, hey, if anybody happens to call in, here's what we're doing and where. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it, you know, it, it, a lot depends on circumstance. It's one thing to be doing it out in a, you know, um, in a, you know, semi-rural area. area or something like that. But in a downtown, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a city, major city parking lot, yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's where there are people who obviously are, they're coming and going and they don't know what's going on. I mean, it yeah. was just, that was not responsible behavior. And yeah. that doesn't, when, when people behave that way, it's not reflecting well on, on the community that they are part of. And so all of us uh, need to, to, um, you know, try and be role models for uh, our communities and, yep. Um, yep. you know, uh, try and show by example what responsible behavior is. Yeah, yep. absolutely. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. Kyle, you're up with this yep. one. Okay. So Craig Dunn asks, are PAL applications 
How long yep. do they normally take? I'm on seven now, seven months now. Chances of it being done before Tr Trudeau's C21 takes full effect. Uh, well, I guess uh, there's several key points in there. One is normally. What is normally? So normally, I mean, the, the, the standard of service is supposed to be something like about 45 days. Okay. Uh, but that hasn't been the case for a very long time. And um, it depends on circumstances. It depends on whether people uh, sent their applications in in paper or whether they uh, sent them in online. Uh, it depends on, on um, uh, a great many um, uh, factors. Like a, a lot of times people have sent their application in, it has a minor uh, problem with it. Um, and that is having a, in the current system where they have a, a very limited um, uh They've had they've been bumping up against their capacity constraints in Miramichi. Um, mm. Something that normally would be only a minor issue is cascading into a major issue, and so it's a um, um, the 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 shorter answer to that is uh, six to twelve months is not uncommon right now unfortunately oh, wow. and um uh, that's one of the things i mean i consider that to be completely appalling it's yeah. totally yeah. unacceptable um it's it has a, a huge impact on people and it's not just you know oh somebody's hobby i mean in many cases it could be uh, you know a rancher who needs that rifle to to uh, go out and uh, uh protect his herd um so um that's part of why I feel it's essential that we bring things back uh, and control them here in Alberta uh, so that we can establish and maintain reasonable, uh, reasonable times. Um, the other thing, uh, the second part of that question was, will it happen before these, this uh, freeze gets cut off? Anybody's guess? Cause we don't know when that date will be. Yeah. I felt that's one of the things I felt most sorry for the people that are still waiting for those R pals to come in and they can't purchase a firearm. And yep, yep. yep. I've got buddies who and... just did their firearms course, spent a weekend and more mm -hmm. time researching and researching pistols and hundreds and hundreds of dollars. And it may turn out that, oh, yeah, sorry if you can't have one. Yeah. Yeah. Next question is, uh, so Paul, he is selling to family members a bunch of his collection. Is there a portal where you can use instead of using the queue? So he's selling. So, yeah, so that's the new transfer. Oh, it, no, it's restricted. So, it, yeah. It won't work. Only won't if work. it's non-restricted. We don't yeah. have access to the restricted transfers. That'd be nice. Saves some calling yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's no way around the, the system thing. right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I emailed in a while ago because I had a transfer that was taking forever. So I just, I couldn't get through. So I emailed them and said, hey, I've been trying for three days to get through. And they emailed me back the next day and said, yeah, go sit on the phone. I'm like, well, you Keep emailed trying. me. <laughs> I literally <laughs> sent you all the information you will ask me for on the phone. Literally everything. Mm -hmm. And they're like, nope, you got a call. Like, oh, well, welcome to 1999. That's fabulous. Yeah. One of the questions, it wasn't really well explained, but one of the questions was specifically about, uh, you You were talking about suppressors. How can we change people's thoughts on that? Because I do know that a lot of people actually don't know that a country that, like European country, like England, you're yeah. required to have a suppressor. Um, mm -hmm. They think more along, I think people in education, people are thinking about, you know, whether it's a John Wick movie or something, they're more of the whole they think about the Hollywood and it is actually something that creates risk or, or more propensity to use firearms in a way that they're not supposed to be used. So how can we actually change that? People are, are people, a couple of people said, how can we change this? Uh, well, I think that, that the, the really important thing is to, um, is education, you know, I mean, we need to, um, get hard facts okay not generalities but say look you know here's the actual rules in this country in that country and be prepared with those when uh, the topic 
comes up and people say, oh, uh, well, you know, uh, we should use uh, Germany as a model for our firearms regulations or England as a model. Oh, really? Well, by the way, here's part of their, their model. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's great. I, I like agree. That. Uh, Dave, do you want to read this one? Uh, Daguerre Phillip says, I have never had this answered. What if Alberta just said no? What if Alberta said people can use their arrows and pistols, providing they are legally allowed to do so? Well, you wouldn't be legally allowed to, because, yeah, there's laws yeah. about that. But can Alberta just tell the feds no? Uh, you no. can or you can or no, choose not to. <laughs> No, I mean, you know, as I, as I said uh, earlier in response to another question, uh, the word of a chief firearms officer doesn't have the force of law, okay? Oh. We make decisions, and our decisions are reviewed by courts. So, um, you know, if, if we refuse or revoke somebody's um, license, uh, they can request a reference hearing. And so uh, it's not a... Um, it's not simply, it's just not an option to just say, uh, no, we're not going to do that because it wouldn't change the law here. And remember, we don't actually enforce the law. Like the chief firearms office doesn't enforce the law. We issue licenses, we uh, uh, authorizations, things like that. We don't enforce the law. The people who enforce the law are the police which is, you know, the RCMP and, and forces like that. And they're going to apply the federal law that's in the criminal code and the firearms act. So right. um, it's, it's, it's a nice thought, uh, but you can't. I put Not up another, like the States. Uh, yeah. I put up another um, more of a statement. People were saying, well, there's Quebec and they do their own thing as well. So it isn't well, actually, it is a fair question because they, they introduced the long gun registry back in Quebec. Well, and, you, yeah, you see the thing is, uh, so again, I'm not a lawyer. Okay. And I'm especially not a constitutional <laughs> lawyer. Um, thank goodness um, on both counts. But um, so there, there is a, there is this thing called the notwithstanding clause but the notwithstanding clause doesn't enable you to opt out of all laws. It enables you to, to, if a certain law would violate someone's charter rights, it enables you to say, we're going to do that anyway. Okay. It doesn't mean that you can say, oh yeah, well, we, we think, uh, you know, uh, murder should be okay. Uh, or, uh, you know, eh, theft under $5,000 is not really all that much. So who cares? You know, we can't opt out of laws like that. Okay. I, I wouldn't suggest that we should, but, um, uh, particularly with those examples, but I'm using that as a, as an illustration of, uh, there are, um, the notwithstanding clause enables you to, uh, get around laws that, um, that um, would otherwise be considered to violate someone's rights. Okay. And uh, so that's what the notwithstanding clause is that people are talking about. It doesn't enable you to just say, well, we're not going to do that. Um, and then on the, the, um, uh, oh, uh, well, anyway, it was a long question, a long answer, but that's ba basic. Oh, uh, the long gun registry. That's what, what the other part was. So they were specifically granted an exemption. They were allowed to do that. It wasn't, they, it wasn't that they um, uh, did something that was prohibited. The, the law allowed them to create the long gun their own long gun registry. So, um, you know, what, what we need to be doing is advocating, and, and this is one of the things that I've advocated for, is uh, that legislation should allow us to opt out of things. Uh, what I want us to do is not just opt out, but... Uh, if the feds are going to spend a big pile of money in a certain way and we choose to opt out, then we should get our share of that money so we can spend it on something useful. I believe that yeah. is a good idea. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just going through. So you've answered some of these questions already, so I'm just going to continue oh. scrolling. Okay. Well, um, I have one that was texted to me while you're scrolling. Perfect. Um, will the CFO help or help implement or pursue getting uh, school programs or education on gun safety back in the schools? Okay. So um, every, 
every uh, province has a slightly different model for how they administer firearms education. In our case, we have a partnership agreement with IHEA, the Alberta Hunter Education Instructors Association, and they basically do all of that, okay? And they do in, uh, there are actually some schools that do have some firearms education in them, okay? And so, uh, and they, they are the ones who are working on that kind of thing. I can tell you that um, I think that it is a, I think that that's a, a viable goal for some schools, uh, but I think that uh, the idea of it being universal in schools uh, would probably be uh, a, a quite a long shot, with the exception that I think uh, where we might have some ability would just be on the very basic element, not firearms usage or anything, but just uh, the safety element of what to do if you see a firearm, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, I think we might be able to work that into the curriculum just as, uh, you know, the same way that, I don't know whether they still do, but long, long ago when I was a child, uh, you know, they did traffic safety in school. You know, you learned, uh, you know, that you were supposed to look both ways before you cross the street and stuff like that. I could potentially see that as a viable goal uh, in in a society today. Back then, they had, they had Elmer the safety elephant was the one who would <laughs> tell us the... Oh, God, I'm old. I remember that, I too. remember that. <laughs> <laughs> that guy. Loved Elmer. <laughs> uh, so... There's just a couple more comments. The majority of the comments were saying thank you for taking uh, so much, uh, taking time out of your baby, busy, busy schedule and coming on and informing everybody about this and uh, also supporting uh, firearms owners in Alberta. There is some questions about other uh, CFOs. What mm -hmm. can we do for our own provinces for those of us aren't? You know what? I'd love to move to Alberta. I'd love for you to adopt me. So... <laughs> Well, come on out here. It's a beautiful <laughs> province. We love gun owners out here. Um, we, you know, um, we have uh, uh, right now things I think are better in Alberta than they've been in quite a while. Yeah. Um, so uh, and I think, you know, if we continue in our direction, they're going to get even better. So, yeah, come on out. Awesome. Kelly and I will carpool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> come on, come on out here, and I'll show you my, I'll show you Japanese military until you run away screaming. <laughs> I will say we were out, uh, we were out at uh, Drumheller in 2019 for our, our charity shoot, and as soon as I went into Alberta, stopped mm -hmm. at a gas station for gas, walked in, they had guns and ammunition, and I'm like. Oh, God, I love this place. <laughs> <laughs> and it felt like home. It really, really felt like home. The people were mm -hmm. awesome. It was just a great place. I loved it. Oh, we have a question. What's the IPSC like out there? So this actually is going, we're, we're going to get into some um, questions for John in just a minute. But this is going to devastate some shooting sports across Canada, specifically IPSC. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what I, you know, uh, one of the things I want to emphasize is that this bill has just been introduced, right? Mm -hmm. It has ideas in it. The bill will not necessarily be passed into its, uh, into actually having effect. And it will not necessarily, even if it is passed, be exactly in the form that it has, it has now. Yeah, true. Uh, and so uh, what I would like to do is to, you know, um, I want to be in on the process of, uh, of um, uh, I have testified before Senate committees for many, many years. The earliest time was back in the 90s, okay, um, early 90s, um, and uh, most recent was 2019, okay. So um, I would like to, us to ha have as much input as possible. And right now, the the, the um, exemptions for competitors is very narrow. It's basically, you know, Olympic right. uh, sports. I have but, a question. Yeah. How, do, how do you get to Olympic level so that you can shoot? Correct. Yeah. Could you say how that you... I'm Olympic level? I'm <laughs> striving for it. It's the magic wand. You need the magic <laughs> wand. But if you can't possess or you can't actually shoot or compete, yeah. how can how you, get you get to, get to that, that level? level? 
Well, I don't. Uh, as as the regulations are structured, one would uh, the the implicit assumption in there is that they're trying to just make sure that this nobody does that it doesn't happen. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, but what I would like to see, um, first of all, I, I would like to see the whole bill just go away. Okay. But if if the bill proceeds uh, as a uh, as a an interme intermediate measure, what we could do is, uh, you know, expand that the person has to be, uh, you know, an active competitor in a recognized international sport. Okay. And of course, then that would allow, you know, IPSC and defensive pistol and cowboy action shooting and, and all kinds of things, which are done on a broad international scale. Um, ideally, we wouldn't need to, to get to that point of having to demonstrate that you're doing that, but it would be better than having it just be Olympic. Right. So in other words, register for as many competitions as possible, shoot in as many competitions as possible until this comes into effect. So the, And then if you're registering, you keep mm -hmm. those copies of everything so that you can prove that you're actually participating in a sport. No, what I what I'm proposing to 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 people, uh, I have a poster that I put up in our Calgary office. It's one of those classic ones, you know, with the crown on it that says "Keep calm and carry on." Mm -hmm. Okay, and so um, you know that's what we all need to do. We need to stay calm. We need to uh, propose viable alternatives to the the ideas that have been put forward we need to avoid inflammatory language we need yep. to be politically active uh and um continue to uh do the things we've done have our gun shows uh have um you know uh competitions yes. um and show that we are an ongoing viable community and that i think is going to be um uh, uh, the way that we're going to accomplish something, you know, is uh, we show that we're responsible people doing safe, responsible things, uh, that we approach our role in society in a responsible fashion, uh, that we are safety minded, uh, that we are public spirited, that we are trying to, in every way possible to have a positive impact on safety. I think that these uh, organizations that are organizing competitions, this is the best thing that you can have in terms mm -hmm. of creating, uh, like every, people bounce this idea around about gun culture, like a gun culture was a bad thing. Every country has a gun culture of some kind. That gun culture is basically how do people view firearms? Okay. And all of these competitions and hunting and uh, collecting and so on. These are the things that create a positive gun culture because they view the firearm as playing a positive role in society. And so if we withdraw those things that are helping to create a positive impression, then all we are left with is the oftentimes sensationalized or negative images yep. that we get in movies, the media, mm -hmm. video games, and so on. And uh, there would be no counterbalance to that. Correct. Absolutely. So guess what it is on June 4th, which is Saturday. National Range Day. It's National <laughs> Range Day. Yes. Get out there. Participate. By the way, fry, fly those freak flags. Like I, they're not freak flags. Yep. Anyways. <laughs> well, I'll be on a range. On, on June 4th, I'll be on a range. I'll be Fantastic. in the Vermilion Gun Club range for a cowboy action shoot. Nice. That's nice. so awesome. But just promote it, share it, tell yes. your friends about it. Because you know what? If you look, Terry, Terry, Terry's out at a range and uh, she's normal and she's a great lady <laughs> and she's a professional. Yeah. So, so what do you think? If I, if I do cowboy action shooting, what do you think my handle should be? Like, Big Red or... <laughs> Quite frankly, I think you've already got an awesome name for it. Just cut the Terry off and go with Jane Bryant. I mean, that's like a mm. sheriff name right there. Yeah. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Are you going to shoot it with a Nambu? Should it be like Nambu <laughs> Weeb or something like that? <laughs> Samurai outfit? Well, I did recently... Uh, I, I recently got a, uh, a Duberti um, 
three fifty seven Magnum, you know, single action army, and and I put I put it in my display because it deceives everybody. It has what they refer to as original finish, so it mm. they basically distressed it so it looks old, mm. and everybody <laughs> thinks it's an antique. But they they didn't make. Oh, that's cool. You know, uh, n- none of the gunslingers use 357 Magnums that I'm uh, aware of. Mm-hmm. Doc Bryant. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. There we Jared go. has one. <laughs> <sighs> awesome. Um, yeah. Anyways. Yeah. Thank you so much. This yeah. has been a great uh, segment. Just well, fantastic I'm- to have you on. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, um, this just goes to show in, in my mind that, you know, you get a bunch of gun people together, you're going to have fun. Yep. It, it's the best community around, um, not slamming uh, other groups. I'm sure the people who like playing tiddlywinks or, uh, <laughs> uh, or uh, you know, uh, uh, collecting Muppet dolls or things, they, they all probably also have a great community. But we have one that's, uh, you know, uh, really outstanding. Uh, it's a community that uh, we should all be proud of. It has a long history. We have our heroes. We have our history. We have our, uh, you know, our our uh, events and traditions. And uh, I want to see that continue uh, for a very long period uh, in in um, into the future and continue to grow. Here, here. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. So. so thank you all for all the work that you're doing as well, because, uh, you know, it's important that we, I mean, in, you know, in my day, you had to actually go to a gun show to meet a, or to the range to meet other gun people. Now there's all these other uh, electronic ways of which I'm only very vaguely familiar, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, uh, I, I, just as times move on and, and, uh, you know, people are now using Glocks and SIGs instead of uh, single action armies, except at cowboy action shoots. Uh, you know, we need to move on in terms of how we form communities, too. And uh, yeah. so I appreciate yeah. the work you're doing to keep at the leading edge of that process. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Derek. Thank you. Awesome. So are we done? <laughs> <laughs> we could just talk for hours yet. Yeah. But. Yeah. Hey, this is fun. Here you have to get up early. Yeah. Well, I do get up early. I do do go to bed early. I do get up early. So. Um, well, well, thanks, Terry. That was yeah. that was amazing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, Everybody's. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I just thank you. Oh, you're more than welcome. You're welcome to stick around. We're gonna t- we're gonna actually talk to uh, Jen a little bit. Okay. And talk about the impacts of C21 right now on the industry itself. So just Jen's with the CSAAA. So we're gonna we're gonna do that. Jen, you all ready? I am. What an act to follow. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> big Jeff, big big Nambu shoes. Holy no kidding. <laughs> I'm serious. Yes, about- um, I'm with CSAAA, the Canadian Sporting Arms and Ammunition Association. Yeah. What, so, do you, what do you do for the folks? What is what is your organization for people who just don't know? Yeah. What do you do? Um, wow. Okay. So we are the organization that supports the industry. Um, basically, every branch of the industry that has anything to do with hunting or firearms. I hope you guys can hear me okay. Yep. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Amazing. Sorry. Thank you. Um. So we uh, are involved in all of the parliamentary discussions that have anything to do with firearm regulations or hunting regulations that would directly impact the industry or the support system for our retailers, uh, dealers, manufacturers. Yeah. So you actually support the industry side of things, the retailers, the manufacturers. Yeah. Opposed to um, the consumer group organizations so with c21 there has been some significant changes over the the last couple of days however before 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 we get there i just wanted to actually get a little bit of uh, information about you i've known you for a little bit yeah you're fantastic lady um but uh, you recently came on board with uh, cs triple a and yes. but why don't you give everybody a little bit of background about who you are and you actually are a shooter you're an outdoors woman you go and hunt okay i'm actually giving you a bio 
I'm going to stop. I'm going to let you do that. Sure. Um, you'll probably do a better job than I will. But uh, yes, I'm a hunter, a shooter. I do IPSC and Steel Challenge. So Bill C21 is really hitting me hard and all of my friends at the range. Um, big into hunting. I live in Ontario, so I mostly hunt turkey, deer, goose. Um, and yeah, other than the handgun or firearms and hunting, I just do CS AAA stuff. This is my life. <laughs> this is your life. It's probably taken on a life of its own, as I said, over the last uh, couple of days as well. I know that the industry has been absolutely I mean, hit hard. We got hit with C71. And then not long after we got hit with, you know, the possibility of C21. So it's just right. The industry is definitely booming right now, extremely busy. And mm -hmm. they're going through tons of challenges. So let's talk about some of those little those challenges. What about yeah. specifically? I know that uh, they, you know, the retailers that we're seeing, they are working. Uh, they're open almost twenty four hours a day now with just trying to get process sales and. That's it. We have um, our retailers, our business members. They're working through the night. They're working all morning. I understand that the system is extremely backlogged. So the online business web services that they use to process these transfers is often yep. crashing. Um, the phone lines are just completely flooded so they can barely get through. They're having a very hard time even processing the transfers that they're getting in. Yeah. And of course, having to do non-restricted transfers now too, doesn't help. <laughs> no, this, it's just compiled. Or, yeah, yeah. I, I really, really feel for them and we don't know what's to come. I mean, we're getting retailers calling in saying, Hey, should we order more stock? Is there going to be a freeze right now? It's. And you're not being brought up to speed on it at all. No, you say that's, that you have that's the big problem. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. We had a meeting this morning with CFP and we had so many questions and concerns. And of course, since like Terry said, the final draft of the regulations aren't available or probably even drafted. They, couldn't comment to most of our questions. Yeah. I actually think that you're correct. It's not, it hasn't been fully drafted. They don't even no. know. Uh, it was a reflex that they've implemented. Saw an opportunity. I'm just going to leave it right there. Okay. Yep. Complete knee jerk <laughs> reaction. <laughs> um, but one of the things that was in C21 was that the bill indicated that businesses won't receive any compensation for business loss or anything that uh, maybe stock that they can't sell. You said won't, correct? Yeah. Okay, good. I, I thought good. I wanted to make sure I heard it. Right. I said, um, yeah. you, okay. No, yeah, that's a big, big question we had. And uh, the answer I was directly given was that they don't need compensation because they can still sell to law enforcement and elite shooters. But I don't see too many law enforcement or Olympic shooters walking into your local gun store to pick up Buying their supplies. Buying an STI. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 That was a concern from a couple people I talked to that are in retail because they're like, well, so we're selling like crazy. But basically, the government has said you better not bring more stuff in because right. you're going to lose money. So I see that as a as a real uh, like a delaying tactic just to try and stop people from importing stuff. Exactly. I mean, they told us that they have not delayed or halted imports from CBSA. That was my question. Yeah. Yes. No, those at this moment have not been, you know, delayed in any way or stopped, but this kind of leaves our manufacturers up in the air also because they don't know what to build next. We don't know what other firearms yep. might hit the OIC going forward. Um, yeah. we weren't even given any sort of a hint as to what the list might look like to tell our manufacturers, Hey, don't make this, do make this. Right. Because that was part of it as well. They said that they are looking at another 350, was it 350 guns that they were going to actually look at to, adding to the OAC? Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. And, um, we kind of pushed for just even a tiny hint, but maybe they don't even know. <laughs> Okay. Well, it won't make as good a, if they give, give you guys a hint. It won't be as good when Justin gets to stand up there and go, "We are keeping you safe from increasing assault weapons." Of course, like William Shatner. We are pushing to make sure that we're involved in every 
possible That's conversation favorite. because this is just going to be detriment detrimental to so many aspects of the industry. Yeah. yeah. Well, why don't we talk about that a little bit? So yeah. finan- financially, uh, the retailers that I know of and also the manufacturers, by the way, have said that uh, based on what they've seen, they will never recover from it financially, that they it will bank them, bankrupt them, essentially. I can definitely um, understand that. I mean, I think in 2021, there was something like $36 million worth of handguns imported into Canada. Mm-hmm. And um, to put that into comparison, I guess there was like 48 million shotgun dollars worth of shotgun imports. Um, So that's a huge, huge portion of their inventory, a huge portion of their income. Like this is their livelihood that's at stake. And the magazine capacity uh, restrictions are another thing that's extremely concerning because again, there's no details on that whatsoever, but we asked what about, non-detachable magazines, shotguns. I mean, this could affect outfitters. Plenty of people come from the States to hunt goose and do different forms of hunting that they can't do down there. They're not going to possibly destroy their firearms to meet Canadian standards to hunt here. Yeah, absolutely. Those were some of the questions that we had previously in in the chat as well. Oh, no, sorry. (laughs) I figured a lot of it was already maybe answered or... Oh, no, no. Absolutely. No, but the reality is people, It from your perspective, this is all about the business side of thing. We have people in exactly. Canada that are, their livelihood is outfitting. Uh, spring bear hunts or going up into uh, the hunting elk or whatever it is. So these people, they, they're wondering if they're actually going to be able to have a livelihood. Exactly. Absolutely. I mean, this is, like you said, their livelihood. This is their job. What are they going to do after this? Mm-hmm. And right now, the right now, what we have for answers is we don't Nothing. know. Yeah. yeah. Literally, of, uh, no comment is the answer. A lot of those people have been hit so hard with, with COVID as well that people haven't exactly. been able to come up for trips and haven't been able to get out to hunting lodges and stuff. So that would be, I mean, even a, even a minor well, quote unquote, minor inconvenience, like you have to buy a new shotgun. I mean, that might just destroy them. Yep. Yeah, 100%. I mean, especially if people are coming into Canada specifically to shoot, they're not going to want to buy a new firearm just for that. And I mean, my concern is what about the manufacturers that send us handguns? If they can't do that anymore, how much are they going to want to work with us if they're so limited as to what they can and can't ship us? Yeah, absolutely true. Oh, they won't. We're such a tiny portion of their market. I mean, it's That's not true. worth the time. Exactly. It's the unfortunate truth. What about, uh, do you hear grumblings from people, especially manufacturers, about uh, their viability here in Canada? They're just going to pack up and head down south? We haven't heard anything yet. Um, okay. Unfortunately, yeah, exactly. No, we haven't heard anything yet. I was, so talk- I guess I was talking just- with someone who was, who was thinking about moving down. They are it's just yeah. well. Um, I mean, it makes sense. <laughs> like, yeah, it's it's, it's if, hard to like like bi- business needs uh, consistent rules in order to thrive, so that they know what what's happening, they know what they could plan for, and when the when the rules consistently change, it's like you can't inv- you can't invest in an environment like no. that, and uh, and we're seeing that with uh, with these rules right now, right? Exactly. Look what happened with BCL. I mean, BCL stopped servicing the Canadian market for semi-auto rifles because why would they? And you look at um, who the heck was it? Uh, there was there was a couple companies that actually moved to the states already. They just said screw it and left. Or Matador. guys, Matador, yeah, Matador, Matador was moved big down. One. Yeah, uh, yep. Gray Birch look, was talking about it. And, yeah. yeah. Well, look at Maccabi. I mean, Maccabi, their entire business is building SLRs, and then the government just says not an AR. Oh wait, it is an AR. You're out of business. Mm-hmm. Like they spent millions of dollars developing that rifle, and all of a sudden, nope, you're out of luck. Yeah. Or uh, Alberta Tactical, how much money did they spend developing the modern sporter? And oh, well, yep, you're out of luck. Yeah. Exactly. So again, you're talking about you've had a conference, call, well, a meeting this morning. Yeah. And it, there was no feedback. There was no. We'll we'll t- we'll catch up later. It's kind of no comment. <laughs> a lot That's of it was they, no. Com- yeah. Yeah, I mean, we had so many 
not solutions, but I guess suggestions that we proposed. And we were basically told, you know what, write it up in a letter, send it to us and we'll look it over. So we're, we're pushing really hard because okay. CSAAA needs to do, you know, something big. This, this is our industry and it's, yep. it's in big trouble right now. Um, gun ranges. I mean, they're going to be in, when any of us go to the gun range, how often do we see rifles? It's almost always handguns that we see, <laughs> at least yeah. at the ones I go to anyways. So how big of an impact will that have on you? As you said, going to the gun range, you have um, people that are shooting pistols typically, but there are rifles there too. But yeah, absolutely. how big of do does the government know is exactly how much money the um, competitive shooting sports bring to bring in like the taxes the range fees everything like that how everything. it actually no, and how much care though i like, know that's the thing dollars, who cares? yeah i mean before i was with cs AAA in 2019 they did an economic impact report that showed that there's an unreal amount of money being spent by the firearm community on hunting and sports shooting and i believe that that was presented to the government but of course I don't think that uh, they took that oh, into consideration. Definitely. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Is it possible to actually challenge that? And the reason that I say that is because of the loss of income and the loss of a livelihood. Do you know? We we have been sort of not openly discussing it, I guess. Um, just thinking about what we can do in general. So, of course, challenging it came across the table um, until we have full details on what these regulations will actually be. We're not sure, but of course, if it goes through, there's a huge loss of income, like businesses will be shut down. So I imagine that there's good grounds to stand on for some legal challenges. Yeah. Well, we've already seen that with the OIC that's currently in place. Exactly. Uh so it's currently being challenged. There's uh, There was a question in the chat and it was about uh, reversing. Is it possible? Do you think that just like uh, to reverse the um, with the AR-15s, will we be able to do it with uh, this one as well? What are your sure thoughts? Or maybe even Terry can comment on that as well. Yeah, I mean, I think Terry would be much better to, I of course don't know about that one, about it being reversed if it is put in place. So uh, if you're asking me if we can reverse a law, well, you know, uh, we had a long gun registry and we got rid of it. That's true. Um, in most of Canada anyway. So anything is possible. You know, my, you know, my earlier comment was, was not a flippant one. It wasn't anything that's actually anti-government, but, you know, uh, about legislatures because a legislature can decide anything, right? They could decide uh tomorrow that um everything is fine you know um one of the things that is it's it's uh, sometimes helpful and sometimes worrying is that uh in a system like ours if there's a majority government uh that majority government can do just about anything yeah yeah and right yeah, now I mean, we don't right now we don't have a majority government although we have a coalition no. So. Yes, a bit. You know what I was getting at is that uh, you know I mean w if we have a change of government, then yes. yeah, anything is possible. Yes. Do I think this government will reverse itself? I don't think so. No. No. I don't okay. Imagine um, so. All right. Uh, at most, I think of some of these measures, if something happened, they might uh, they might put it on the back burner. You know, if something they were if they if something else came up that they had to focus on. Come yeah. on, Russia invasion. <laughs> uh, well, let's hope not. <laughs> <laughs> so, however, if... I do speak Russian. So, oh, wow. do you? Yeah, no. oh, perfect. <laughs> Dang, well, oh, wow. I studied You'll back. In, I studied in the Soviet Union back in seventy eight, seventy nine. Oh, you must no, be on no. their list too. Okay. No, to all of our <laughs> Soviet collaborators, you have a CFO possibility in Alberta once you invade. So, yeah. just <laughs> pointing that out. All right. <laughs> Um, we, I did ask you privately when somebody was asking about the um, impacts on the airsoft and uh, also, so you do have 
a little insight on that, specifically from the retailers and the manufacturers and the people that are importing this? How devastating is it going to be for them? Oh, yeah, this would be, I mean, right now, um, sorry, I'm trying to make sure it's, I believe it's CBSA that sets the regulations for what would be deemed a, a replica airsoft firearm. So um, and it's anything that has the likeness or <sighs> might somewhat replicate a firearm. I mean, that's any, that's our break action pellet gun. Yeah. Like, So yeah, um, I mean, this is a huge branch of any sport, any, there's retailers that are specifically set up for air guns. So, I mean, that's their entire business. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Like we were proposed maybe in the States, I believe it's regulation that they have orange tips so that they can easily identify them from real firearms. But of yeah, course, had, that was... We had uh, Donna Langman on from Wasega Beach Paintball a while ago, and she was she was talking about that. And a, a good, all their business is paintball, but yes. they also do uh, airsoft, airsoft rentals, airsoft sales, airsoft days. And I mean, if they're not allowing the import, that sport will just die. And it's unfortunate yeah. because Absolutely. those sports are, are really taking off right now. Yeah. I mean, it's just like our IPSC and our IDPA, all of the, or three gun, any of the firearms that require any of these handguns or firearms that are possibly going to be banned, like the sport's just going to die off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nobody and can get into it. Uh, nobody can get into it, but those that are actually participating in it. So one of the things in the bill was saying basically that, so people, if they already own that firearm, they'll be able to use it. They won't be able to grandfather. They won't be able to um, transfer it to uh, a, a, uh, a another family, family member or, or whatever. Yeah. But what about those parts, those things? What happens if it breaks? What happens? So, and from the industry side of things too, like you're going to need to have things like more mags. You're going to have a vibe and you're the going to have to have all the accoutrements to go with your your nice new fancy new pistol that you just bought be on Monday night. So exactly. I mean, as far as sports shooting goes, like if I need a new slide for my CZ or a new magazine, how am I going to get that? I mean, I don't imagine retailers are going to be stocking that if they're not selling new handguns, they're not going right. to sell as many accessories. So optics, um, shooting belts, any sort of sporting accessory or firearm accessory. And what about the uh, people that are importing it or distributing or uh, sending it to us? So are they willing to work with Canada, basically? Or are they just going to? We're not sure yet, but if there's much less stock being ordered, it's hard It'll to say how much they're going to yeah. want to. Exactly. The price is going to go yeah. up big time. And how much are they going to want to work with us if we're just ordering very limited stock? Right. Yeah. So again, it's going to, impact. it's going to impact. Yeah. People that already own these handguns. I mean, if something breaks and they can't get parts. The well, I was thinking ceases. about, I was thinking about that today. Cause I was talking to a, a young fellow at work who just bought a handgun, bought a Glock and he wants to do IPSC with it. And he said, well, you know, a friend of mine had a Glock accidentally got an overload, uh, a, a heavy load cracked the frame. What oh. do I do if that happens to me? And I said, well, buy a half dozen Glocks, I guess, because yeah. if something <laughs> happens to your competition pistol, you're, you're hosed, you're out of the game for good. If you can't get new pistols. If, if uh, YouTube's any indication, hot glue uh, will fix everything. Oh, <laughs> I will definitely hot glue my pistols. You need to make together. one of those, uh, those <laughs> DIY crafts, uh, hot yeah. glue on your Glock frame and <laughs> alien tape. Oh, alien that's our tape. Solution, there, you go. Nice. <laughs> there you go. I'll never order a new part again. I'll just get some uh, glue sticks. Yeah, a little glue stick on the part. <laughs> You're good to go. Apparently. <laughs> Gorilla glue. It's fantastic. Yes, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> so, so what are your thoughts? What are your What do you think? Like, I think shows these. That's another thing. I mean, yeah. the gun shows. People go to the gun shows to see the neat guns, the cool guns, all of the guns that are being prohibited. Are our manufacturers or retailers going to want to even show up to these gun shows if they can only bring a very, very limited amount of firearms that may or may not be sold or people may or may not even attend these shows anymore if handguns and our ARs and whatnot aren't <laughs> going to be present? 
So the, yeah, so so for example, like Tacom or um, yeah. even the Toronto Sportsman Show, that's actually gonna it's gonna have a negative effect on that. Yeah, absolutely. As well, yeah. And I mean, I know we're discussing C twenty one, but even C seventy one, these gun shows run on the weekends, and the call center's yep. not open. If they don't have access to internet, then they won't be able to process transfers. That's another thing. Yeah, we are, we're <laughs> concentrating on right now C twenty one, but C seventy one, C seventy one. As uh, Terry was talking about, uh, it actually has an effect, and especially on those people that are in up in northern uh, areas where we don't have internet that's reliable. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So, what's the feedback no. been from your members about specifically that C seventy one? They're very concerned about the record keeping portion. They have to keep specific records in their store for twenty years. Um, with people's personal information on it. So of course, having that, their insurance is going to increase because there's going to be the um, personal information of people just logged in their stores. They're going to have to increase their security. So that's yep. a much higher cost for them. And yeah, I mean, the system's backlogged, so it's constantly crashing or they can't get through on the phones. We did ask about if the CFOs will be given more funding because obviously they're bombarded with work right now between C21 and C71. Um, we were told that they were given funding in January, but of course, this all came in May. So January was a long time ago. <laughs> a lot has hit them since January and I feel for the CFOs, I feel for the retailers, like everyone's just yeah. getting hit. Yeah, hmm. and I'm sure that Terry can agree that that money isn't really there for these reactions or what's taking place currently right now. And yeah, yeah. so um, specifically about CS AAA, uh, yeah. we had some <laughs> we had some questions. So how do we support you guys? Like there was somebody asking, do you have to be a retailer? Or do you have to be a manufacturer to be a member? So since we are an industry organization, you do have to be in some aspect of the hunting or firearm industry. We have um, individual memberships for people that are part of an organization like CCFR or NFA or okay. CSSA. Um, we have media memberships for people that are... Um, which Sorry. Slam Fire Radio quality? Yeah, like Slam Fire Radio, <laughs> yes. Podcasters, um, people that write the newsletters, uh, retailers, dealers, manufacturers, outfitters. Okay. Anyone that's sort of, yeah, in the circle of firearm or hunting industry. Okay. So what about sponsored shooters at all? Um, no, I believe that would fit more under the consumer groups. Okay. But uh, that's a good question, actually. I because, thought I'd ask it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's actually a good thing to look into, especially now with C21 hitting the shooter so hard. Yeah. Yeah. So there we have some uh, sponsor shooters on, that are uh, on our feed tonight. And I know that one of them actually specifically asked, can I be a member of, uh, of your organization as well? Yeah, no, that's something I would definitely want to take back to the board because that's a very good idea. We are of course, trying to support the ranges as well. And um, I understand that IPSC was just recognized under GIASF. So maybe like we're trying to push, maybe they can be considered elite shooters. Like, Well, I think they are. Yeah. I if, mean, hey, if Adriel could be uh, considered an Olympic uh, shooter and Dremel tool guy, um, <laughs> then IPSC should be actually easily I, attainable. Yeah. I agree. I mean, right now they're saying only Olympic and Paralympic, but yeah. I so they know. Uh, uh, okay, within Canada, do you know how many uh, of those types of level of shooters? So they said, don't worry about it. Your industry is not going to get affected at all. You'll still be able to <laughs> sell to LEO and Olympic <laughs> level shooters. So let's talk about that a little bit because. I do know that our Olympic program is a fantastic program, but I'm not thinking that there is too many people at that specific level. No, absolutely. I mean, I'm assuming most of them are under the uh, at least Ipsic Black Badge level. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to find. So you're asking how many sports shooters? Yeah, basically would be able to qualify me 
so at an Olympic level, international level, there our community is not that big. No, um, and I'm not sure to be honest how many shooters would uh, we don't deal much with actual shooters, unfortunately, yet. Okay, like sports shooters, right? But the what I'm I think the reason why that I'm asking is because the questions that you're asking. The response is that don't worry about it. You'll be fine because you'll be able to sell to these athletes and then you'll also be able to sell to LEO as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that's actually something that we haven't looked into is um, how many Olympic shooters are actually in Canada because it's such a small portion of the funds that the industry would get. So no, that's a good question. I thought I'd ask you something yeah. that you can actually give back to them saying, listen, it's, it's not this that is many. such a small portion. Exactly. Yeah. Right. There's not many walking into your local gun store to buy a new pistol on the regular. Right. So what about manufacturers themselves? I know that recently there is, uh, there is uh, the Canadian military was, uh, they're going to be buying the Seiko there. Uh, what about Canadian uh, manufacturers specifically that are, are designing rifles are they how can they sell how can they sell to those they're okay the, the reason why i'm asking the question is one they don't know what the bill is going to entail correct It'll be added to uh the um the oic from two years ago as well right yeah. Uh, but they're also being told that don't worry about it, that you'll be able to sell your firearms. And so uh, basically we're in flux, right? Or they're in flux. I don't see them as coming off well either. No, absolutely. And um, that's one of the reasons we were looking for so much clarification on what could potentially be hitting the OIC and, what the mag capacity limits would look like or mag restrictions would look like for non-detachable magazines because our manufacturers don't know what to keep producing and yep yeah it's yes, basically yes, it's, tough it's it. really hard when there's just no information out there for us yeah yeah um terry uh, uh we initially told you this is going to be like 30 minutes we're way past there <laughs> it's two <laughs> hours Please, like, you don't need to stick around. We're more than ha- uh, happy that to have you on, though. Okay, well, thank, thank you very much. I, I, it's been a great pleasure being here. And uh, uh, I've seen Jen's picture in uh, Access to Firearms, I think, in the, in the CSAAA ads. So it's a pleasure to meet you virtually as well. And uh, so I'm going to go off and have my very first very meal of the day. See, nice it's 7 o'clock at night. Uh, wow. And uh, then maybe do a bit of work and uh, hopefully uh, – Get a little bit of time to go to bed before uh, you start the whole thing again tomorrow. <laughs> thanks. So okay. okay. Thank nice. you guys. Terry. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you, you very much for coming Bye. on. And Bye thanks now. for all your hard work. Thank you. No. Do I need to click? <laughs> <laughs> Leave that in the outtakes. <laughs> Got it. That is awesome. <laughs> there she's waving goodbye. Okay. Yeah. So overall, I, I wanted to have you on just because it seems like I do understand that um, we're not getting much. I wish done. I wish we had more information to offer. Exactly. I mean, we have members calling and I wish they would give us just a, just a little bit. Just help. Yeah. Um, you have yeah, any idea how many question. pistols were sold about this in, in the last couple of days? Uh, oh, sorry. Oh. I'm, throwing a, I'm throwing a question on top of... Uh... She's trying to answer your question there, I think, Kelly. Oh no, that's yeah, okay. No. Um, as far as pistols, as far as pistol sales go, I think it was close to like sixty thousand since month. <laughs> <laughs> what we normally do in a year—that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Our a lot. the retailers are just—I mean, there's lineups out the door. It's a lot. They're busy. I feel. I feel for them. They are just exhausted. They're working through the night. They're up early mornings trying to battle the business web services plus <laughs> the huge influx yeah. of sales. Um, yeah. Anything There's a else lot that, going out the door. Anything else that they're telling you? Any other questions? You said you're con- getting constant emails or calls. 
a lot of it is just about the airsoft uh, regulations, the mag capacities. I mean, people don't know if they're going to have to modify their lever actions and shotguns. Um, and then how do you even modify half of like the 1022 magazines? I mean, those can't be modified, I think. Of course, I yeah, um, yeah a lot of just... <laughs> <laughs> With a Dremel and JB Weld, anything's possible, but just because oh, it's possible I... doesn't mean it's a good idea. I thought we were yeah. doing Gorilla Glue. Are we doing JB Weld now? Oh, uh, Gorilla Glue. My my favorite's JB Weld, but I guess oh, okay. Really learn it. Let's talk up on that. <laughs> I'm gonna... I'm gonna try putting a firing pin and a Glock back together with you both can... and see what has see which one works better. We'll do a video. Yeah, you can sand and shape JB Weld. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh, pretty. <laughs> Um, don't want to do it though. Don't want to do it if I don't have to. <laughs> Especially like, okay, my Ruger 1022 mags. I don't care about them as much, but I've no. got, uh, I've got a tube fed 22. That was my grandma's uncle's from the 40s. I don't want to hack the tube on it because no, uh, the government thinks that that's going to be, be that. stop some mass shooter <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, in the just... states. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I have a couple of friends who are a friend who just bought an antique lever gun that takes six rounds. So he's like, do I have to destroy this like hundred and something year old gun? Like, well, probably. We'll see. <laughs> Government doesn't care, but we'll, I mean, uh, we'll see. And perhaps they didn't even take into consideration that some firearms don't have a detachable magazine because who knows how much knowledge they have about this. Oh, I know. Very little. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to be nice. Oh, oh, I know. WTF. Well, I mean, the the it, they're they're not designed to be effective. The regulations are designed to um to get votes. They're they're not yes. really designed to stop any shootings or anything like that. It's uh, yeah. So it it's it's we want yeah. to apply some logic to it, but uh, it's really not a a, a good exercise. It's not. And that unfortunately became very clear when we asked. A ton of very logical questions about the bill and we're not given any answers because they didn't have answers well i suspect it was like the may thing where it was just sitting on somebody's desk waiting for something to happen but they hadn't really put any thought into how this would actually practically work from a logical standpoint exactly no thought behind uh, actually enforcing what's put on paper well, they actually did put some thought into it when the first version of it came out. They presented it and it was read. So C21, I mean. Um, so it was read once, read twice, and then it started to go through the process. And it was, they called the election. So it was defunct. Or, uh, but they revamped it, or so they brought it back, obviously, yes. right? And they've been waiting. So during that time, they have been looking at other ways to actually, or other measures to implement as well. But I don't think that they got it right from the perspective of how are we going to do this? Because it's, um, yeah, it's a mess. Absolutely. Yeah. And I know you were asking about how many um, Olympic shooters there are. When we did run our economic impact report, there was 1.4 million sports shooters yep. in Canada. I mean, that's not saying that they're Olympic shooters whatsoever, but I imagine that number has grown drastically since 2019. I know a lot of people got into yeah. sports shooting during COVID. Um, that's a lot of people that are affected by this. And that's a lot of retailers and manufacturers and dealers and <laughs> gun ranges losing money once these people can't go and compete. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Uh, we do have a question from Russ. He's wondering about what about those uh, firearms that are under warranty and it breaks? What are we supposed to do with them? Tough then? luck. No import export. As far as I know. For the <laughs> there's, handguns? No if there's, there's no import export. How do you? Because, like, we don't have any locally made handguns in Canada. They're all no. imported. Yeah. yeah. So, how would the retailer that get another one in for warranty? No stuff they haven't thought about. Oh, it was, they don't care. It was my understanding that they may still um, allow import because they're saying that our retailers can still sell to law enforcement and elite shooters. Mm. But so that yeah, that's limited stuff, right? Exactly. That's the big problem. It's so limited that our U.S. manufacturers are even going to want to. Yep. Well, we already this. know that. 
<laughs> yeah. So get in Photoshop, make yourself an elite shooter badge. So you have this to present when you go to buy a gun and then you're good to go. Exactly. Yeah. Make some patches. Ooh. Yeah. I was just thinking that we can get patches made up. Yeah. Trudeau certified elite shooter. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks guys. Um, We're helpful. We're helpful. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, is there any other questions that you guys have i'm going to actually scroll through the uh the chat see if there's any other questions that we didn't get answered um but i know a big question that i've seen floating around and i'm not sure if um it was answered by terry already but people were wondering if they've purchased a firearm and this freeze just happens will they still be able to get that firearm um good question if the transfer has been initiated by your retailer, whoever you bought it from, then yes, when the freeze, if the freeze happens, then whatever is currently in, pro in um, process stage will still be processed as usual, if that makes sense. Sorry, that was a really confusing way of me wording it. <laughs> no, that makes sense. Yep. But yeah, cool. it's not just going to get canceled and thrown out. Well, a lot of guys They'll are worried about that. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Especially yeah. since everyone's going on a big shopping spree right now. Yeah. yeah, I found it really hilarious that one of the news articles I was reading said the the federal government expects no increase in sales numbers with this announcement. I'm like, really? <laughs> so in other words, you're just trying not to freak people out would be my guess. But that's hilarious. Yeah. Everyone else did. Okay, so from... Uh, Michael, Michael Loberg, so yeah, watching. I was just looking at that. Thank you, Michael. Okay, you can export it uh, to have it repaired and sold out of country, or sell it to a business for repair. Never to okay. return, and then not, and then never get back. it back. Mm -hmm. Indeed, it's hope great, it doesn't though. break. Oh, my shadow two is like one of the really early ones that the the frames broke. Mine hasn't broken yet. JB Weld. Maybe yeah, they'll use a spot weld. Yeah, there we go. Maybe I'll braze it. <laughs> we'll take the whole tiny stuff in there. Uh, so, uh, Donna, uh, we did have um, we did have Carrie or sorry Terry, uh, the Alberta CFO, mm -hmm. uh, speak about this. How long the process uh, will take to become law? Right now, we're not that sure. Correct. Yeah. Um, did they actually? The meeting that they had with you today, did they give you any indication? Probably not, though, right? Not at all. Um, it can happen in the fall. They can decide to implement it sooner rather than later if they decide not to review it in Parliament. Um, we were given nothing. It was either, it was basically like tomorrow or in two years. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, like a rock basically band, i am not quoting anyone but that is basically yeah what we were told yeah probably okay. best for anyone out there who has an rpl and no handgun to find a handgun we yep. are strongly recommending that people go and buy whatever they want to buy before this gets hit the whatever is left slim pickings right now yeah if there's anything yeah. left in stock of course <laughs> most of it's pretty weird but there's new stuff coming in like i was, I was just on facebook before we started here and uh, a bunch of the different retailers say oh just got a shipment in and it's gone yep. the website probably gone again but um you don't are have... still getting stock in absolutely yeah. yeah you might not be stuck like all if all you can find is real weird stuff um it might there, more more new stuff might come in the yeah. country more, this was made then no longer exists so there's a, there there is new stuff coming in. Somebody just commented that SFRC has some brand new stuff in stock. Absolutely, they they're waiting for their uh, stuff to come in. I know that they just got new stuff in because I went and bought a pistol from them yesterday. Yeah. So, um, but and how... you got a, a desirable yeah. pistol because <laughs> if we think about like the kinds of pistols that you could get for like your forever pistol. That if you're a brand new shooter and you don't have anything, a shadow is is pretty damn good. They're good for shooting mm -hmm. at the range. They're yep. good for uh, uh, competition. Uh, there will be parts availability for them in the future, like a, a shadow yep. or a Glock or a 1911 or a P320 or something like that. Those you're will good. all be great choices. Yeah, big shadow uh, fan. Yeah, uh, it's the other guns. 
that you're going to be hooped basically if uh, you need parts for it. Um, but so I was still, on FRC. still buy a pistol. Yeah, Go I ahead. was on SFRC last night because I got an email from them that said that, uh, hey, we've got some guns in. I went, there were like five handguns listed on their website. <laughs> and now there's, there's some, probably there's, 30. Yeah, they're oh, selling them almost as nice fast ones. as oh. we're getting in. Yeah, That's so. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, lots of nice ones too. Yeah. So get it, get on that FSRC. Yeah, Kyle, do you want to read what uh, Michael has posted? We should have just had Michael on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Michael Loberg says there is a ban in the bill that will come in force in the fall, and a separate ban in a new regulation that can come in, into force any day now. Correct. So it's a little bit of both. Yeah. David okay. saying that Cabela's Calgary still has deliveries from their warehouse. I was um, just before the show here, I was talking with uh, my neighbor and he was saying that Cabela's was just a gong show and like, oh, yeah, pretty empty, pretty empty. Take a number and yeah. And even that they're, they're selling quick and there's really not much out there. Speaking of not much out there. <laughs> it's because guys like this are buying all the handguns. <laughs> <laughs> 10 millimeter, dude. It's Dave. A 1911 and 10 millimeter at that. Interesting. Mm. Well, that would mm. be punchy Very fun. Cool. Spicy. Yeah. Model 41. I was looking at, I was thinking about revolvers, um, but uh, then I remembered I hate revolvers. So I just... I'm just happy I got my stupid little Ruger. <laughs> yeah. If I was to get a revolver, it'd be the Rhino. But then I looked at the price and was, no. But you can't probably can't get another one. So really, I'd already bought two pistols though. So that the price is like, mm, <laughs> I've already depleted my bank account enough. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm willing to borrow a bit of money this time around. <laughs> That's um, all that's left. Yeah, yeah it's on. true. Um, yeah. revolvers if you actually so Jen as Jen said she, she's going to encourage anybody if you want a gun right now go and buy it <laughs> yeah yep. so stock These... is going back in too so you don't have to buy a revolver if you don't want to <laughs> thankfully everyone seems to be very patient with um, the people like the employees and our retailers because they're dealing with business web services going down they're not able to call in to do transfers they're just beyond busy so it's we're getting feedback that a lot of the consumers are being very patient and understanding so that's great yeah well, that's good yeah unprecedented volume of sales yes like one of, one of the shop posts that i saw was that they were just like our doors are closed today and tomorrow we're just gonna like everyone all hands on deck catch up. like yeah, yeah gotta catch up and i i approve that's uh that's, so a, that, that's a good thing to do yeah so i see on i've been trolling facebook and the various uh retailers and i know that the calgary shooting center was actually making it put a sign up and said uh wait six hours you start here uh yeah. we'll <laughs> let you in in six hours uh there's other locations that are saying please be patient with us please don't keep messaging us or calling or yeah. or emailing we're we're just trying as fast as we can and yeah. ever it's kind of like if you're flooding us e us with emails we can't get to what we need to do yeah exactly, exactly. why is my why is my transfer taking so long because you keep emailing us yeah because you keep you emailing email, don't calling. email again yeah yeah, yeah so yeah so the biggest thing from that is just be patient with our retailers are trying as fast as we can be patient with our look at terry be patient with our cfos yes absolutely Try. They've kind of been yeah. thrown into this mess, also. Yeah. 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 Sean, if you want a Wrangler, the Wranglers are out there. I did see like there's a yeah, pile there. of them in there, so um, you will find you can find a Wrangler. If you want to find a Shadow One or Two, <laughs> it's not looking good. <laughs> if you want to find a Wrangler, they're out there. There's a bun There's a couple Shadows that just went up on CGN, but they're like 1900. Yeah, uh, but on CGN you gotta like you gotta call in. Yeah, now you're and calling good, in. Good luck. Yeah. Good luck calling in right now. Yeah. So that's the other thing too. People don't be um, checking your prices as well. I've seen that too. So um, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna wait and a week and I'm gonna I'm gonna sell the crap that I don't want for way more than it's worth. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Ooh. 
some people don't like that. Some people don't like that capitalist, like, <laughs> buy low, sell high kind of a thing. But that's what I'm all about. <laughs> yep. Got to survive. Generous. Yep. We can also take up, uh, you know, as uh, somebody is taking up stock in fishing. Is, uh, sorry, finding things for other people. Oh, Mike. Ooh. Message Mike. If you want something, he's willing to actually look it up for you. So far, it's 15 for 15. I was I, I was helping some new RPAL owners find some guns. Yeah, I was yeah. fielding some like last minute. Like I gotta get something now. What should I get? I don't know what I need, and I, I help them find some good deals. And yeah, I saw that big post you put up on uh, Facebook with here's all the stores that have everything available. I'm like, wow, good way to go, Adriel. Well, awesome. not everything, but like I was trying to, if I was shopping, what would I want, and what's still yeah. available right now. And I was just trying to post that because, like, I'd get another question. A guy wants to, oh, where can I find a Glock 48? Oh, well, I don't know. Let's just let me just look at yeah. what all the shops have. Now that list is entirely out of date. But yeah, <laughs> it's out of yeah. date probably half an hour after you posted it. Yeah, five minutes later, it's <laughs> no longer valid. Yeah, yeah. So I do know that CS AAA has something exciting happening on this weekend. What's going on? Well, um, actually, uh, it's just myself that is hosting the National is Ranch it? Day. Yes. <laughs> I, didn't, I thought it was the SAA. I know. No, it's just me. Um, yeah, I'm hosting National Range Day at my local range. It started as I was just going to register a few members of the community to come in, try a few guns. I had 40 spots open. We were going to do, you know, 10 shooters per segment. And I got so much interest that I thought, holy, I have to do an open house. Uh, so we're doing a big open house at our range and it's going to be cool. super fun. We're going to have our cowboy action team out there demonstrating what they do. That's our cool. Ipstick and steel challenge, uh, challenge team showing what they do. Um, I'm going to have a lot of educational pamphlets and posters. CUSF is setting up a booth to give more information. Yep. Um, yeah, it's going to be awesome. I'm very excited. Excellent. I think this We're... is going to be great. And after C21, I think our uh, industry and community needs this more than anything. Yep. Yeah. I good agree. timing. Yeah, absolutely. So your local club is the Cornwall Pistol Revolver Club. Uh, Cornwall Handgun hand Club. Hand yeah. Handgun Club. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Which is... People need to pre-register. Do they just roll in? What, what's the What's the scoop? I have registration open um, just so I can get a general idea of how many people are going to be attending so I can have enough because we're doing a barbecue and stuff. So it's a free, free event. Just show up and have fun. Um, I just want to make sure we have enough supplies and hands on deck. Um, right now we have about 140 people registered, but I have told people like, wow. I know. Nice. I, know. Wow. <laughs> I hope you have a lot of help. That's a, uh, that's a yes. big event. Yeah. Our range, just like every other range is absolutely amazing. So I have yep. no shortage of volunteers. Um, but yeah, if people just want to roll in, if they don't want to register, they can just pop in. It's not not a big deal and yeah that's running from 10 to 3 on saturday and i think you guys are probably all doing something for national range day also yep mm -hmm. yeah that's well sweet. yeah so i'm going to be at eoc which is in ottawa we're going to be doing yes. the the big one there so and there's a I'm bouncy sure. castle and everything right Ooh. yeah it's literally a circus <laughs> <laughs> sounds very exciting pre-register yeah. actually how do people uh no, people no? need to pre-register. People and just roll straight in. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I, I know. I I won't be at an actual gun range, but I'll be at it with Sega Paintball for their thirtieth anniversary because that happens to fall on the same day. I think you need to support them too. Yep. Yeah, that's gun related. Maybe, I'll be at uh, off gun. Sherwood Park. That one does have pre-registration. I'm gonna post. I'm gonna share it on uh, Slamfire after the show so that people can okay. register on that thing. So what is so one of the things that uh, people should do is actually, if you are hosting a June 4th event, share it everywhere. Uh, send it to us. We'll share it on, on Slamfire uh, personal pages as well. So uh, send us that stuff over, Jen, and we'll actually uh, share it for you too. Thank you. That's amazing. Yeah, I don't think people understand how much um, promoting the event on social media actually helps. I mean, that's kind of been the main traffic source for me and... 
I think we need to make this really, really big this year. Yeah. 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 First year be uh, Bill C-21 hits us. We need to <laughs> go all out. <laughs> yeah. We all need a little hope. Yeah. Little hope good public, uh, good public information a question for you for the uh, for the range days and from what you've heard not just for your range but other ranges have you had media interest in it like local papers or anything yeah actually um we i mean we're i'm in a very small rural community so our local papers aren't you know super well known by anyone that's not <laughs> in this community but yeah we uh there are a few local newspapers that want to go to EOSC. They're going to come to the Cornwall Handgun Club. There's been quite a bit of interest, which I'm kind of surprised about and happy about. Nice. I reached out to uh, quite a few of our local newspapers, and they said that they've got National Range Day marked on their calendar and a few places to check out. So that's <laughs> really exciting. It's not and my I know- announcement, link, but I think we're going to have a, a TV station at ours in at uh, Sherwood Park. Oh, that would be really cool. Be neat. Awesome. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, regardless, I think I'm just going to do a write up and take a ton of pictures and just send it out to anyone that wants to post it because I kind of want the right story out there and a good story. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. Share it out. Share yeah. it out. Yeah. If if we can get lots of uh, lots of coverage of this, it looks normal and it's just you know something that that's happens. the main thing. I mean, I want stuff. people to see. We're just normal yeah. people. We're not. <laughs> yeah. Not crazy. We're good. No one. That's always been one yeah. of our, our big challenges is that you know we've hidden for so long that so many people just they think they don't know anyone who owns guns. And exactly. I know there's so many people when you start talking to people. I notice that at work. I'll just be talking to people and the guy's like, oh, yeah, about a Glock last week or oh, yeah, I hunt or I shoot skeet or whatever. But a lot of people don't tell other people what they do. So, yeah. You should. Sorry, yeah. I had to put it up. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say. <laughs> I didn't think that was uh, that was contested. I thought that was pretty obvious for our audio listeners. Doug Ford just got reelected. Yeah, uh, but I, I think that was pretty much a, a uh, Lex, Lex Luthor was defeated. It's terrible. Anyways, so for okay, you know what? This means that Ontario has a little good news. We had some other great news on tonight. We had Terry who's supporting Alberta. We have Jen that's supporting our retailers and our manufacturers here in Canada. We have June 4th happening where we're having a national range day. And it actually is looking good. I can go to sleep tonight. (laughs) (laughs) Good to have good news, eh? It's not all doom and gloom. Yep. Well, in the end, I mean, no matter what happens here and what gets banned and everything, get whatever guns you can whatever's yep. legal go and shoot yeah. them have a great time support your local retailers and just keep our keep our communities alive and you know don't 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 fall to despair and pick up golf or lame sports exactly <laughs> yeah <laughs> is there anything that else that we want to talk about we've been on for two and a half hours which is a long time for us even for those that are driving long distances and, and like to listen to us on during those drives but John, do you want to cover anything that we didn't talk about? Nothing I can think of. I really wish I had more information about um, C21, but uh, I think right now that's. Yeah. 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 Well, I could have offered more. Let us know if you do get any information. I absolutely will. Whether it's by Twitter or (laughs) carrier pigeon. No no emergency (laughs) alerts via Twitter. Yeah. 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 No. But uh, yeah, let us know. And we'd love to have you on again once we actually do know more about C21. And then also the impacts on those gun shows and the different things as well, if that's going to. Yeah, I want to get actual. um, I have been reaching out to a lot of our manufacturers, dealers, you know all of our members because I want to see exactly how it's impacting them and this needs to be presented to the government I mean whether they will listen or care the information at least needs to be offered so that they can see how they're drastically affecting these people's lives yeah yeah Mm -hmm. and hopefully we get a little coverage on that aspect from some of the news so they can see just how unreasonable it is when you know the reasonable side says well maybe we do this and then compromises go to hell yes exactly no, um, the news needs to hear, everyone needs to understand how this is just going to negatively impact so many people and with no benefit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 
All right, everybody. Shall we close yeah. out the show? Let's close. I think out so. Show. Make yeah. it awkward like we usually do. <laughs> so you don't oh, have. No, my, you can't see my camera. We're on, gonna. I'm maybe staring at you. <laughs> well, I am the queen We're of all awkward. At you but too, uh, so. <laughs> thank you guys very, very much for having me on here. Oh, yeah, thank thanks, you so Jen. much, Jen. Thanks, Jen. Jen. Uh, Jen, have a great time this weekend, and we're going to connect sometime because I do actually have some of your property that I'm still <laughs> need to get back to. <laughs> yeah, you do. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, okay. yeah. Thanks right. everybody for coming on. Later, everyone. All right. Yay. So, if you have any comments or questions for the show, please send an email to slamfireradio at gmail dot com. Now, go grab a gun and shoot something. When the talking is over, it's time to get a gun.